One thing that I, I, I kept hearing stories all throughout when this film came out that all these weird occurrences and phenomena happened during the making of that, and now I'm talking to the source. Mm -hmm. Are any of those true? Anything weird happened? What you heard were stories <laughs> and rumors and myths. Everybody has a different take on many things that happen in life. You can put people in the same room or the same uh, accident or something, and, and they're going to tell you a different thing. That's why, you know, like when people say, you know, can, can you verify that this was the person? You know, it's hmm. not always true. For me, they always say that young people are very aware if there's anything odd that's going on. I never felt anything weird went on on the set. Um, when the set burned down, it was an electrical shortage. I mean, that's what happens. But it was much more fun to say, ooh, you know. The film was a very difficult film to make. There's, you know, there's no two ways about it. And I think it stood all by itself. But for a while, the myths and rumors went around, and then they circulated more and more. And um, from, from my point of view, no, they're not true. And if you talk with Bill Blatty, he, he basically shares my, my same thoughts about it. You cleared all of it for me. I appreciate that. Okay, we're done. Thank the you. other thing, when the movie <laughs> came out, there was a lot of concern by parents about you in that film and mm -hmm. the content of the film. Yep. Were you aware of that at the time? Oh, yes. And did you feel real guarded while you made the film? Yes, I did, actually. Um, my mother was always around. She was not on the set. She was upstairs in the dressing room. She, uh, I had worked since I was five years old, doing modeling and commercials in New York. She trusted me, and she trusted Billy Friedkin. And I know they had a lot of discussions um, uh, about things that you know. I don't generally, you know, I don't, I don't know. They were private, but I, I know she trusted Billy. And so he, of course, would take me into his office and say, "Okay, here's the dialogue for tomorrow." So he kind of bypassed mom. <laughs> And um, I'm sure she was as, as uh, freaked out about it as, as all of us were, you know, did later make, on. Did making this film and starring this film and the phenomenon of the film, especially now in retrospect, because you have some years on it, um, did it change your life for the better or for the worse? Well, it's not that it's for the better or for the worse. It, it certainly had an influence, a large influence on my life. It made me have the life that I have. So in other words, I was able to do some of the most amazing television films, mm -hmm. which I'm very, very proud of. It also put me in situations that I um, were not necessarily the right place at the right time, which caused a lot of controversy. And years down the road, what, what I do have on my side is that your character will always prevail down the road. And mm -hmm. people know who I am now. They know, you know, I stand up for issues and rights of things that animals and children and adults that, that I feel are, you know, being misused and and uh, and so I think that now people are very comfortable. They know I'm not mentally ill. Well, <laughs> you're, you might be fun, but you're not mentally ill. Right, exactly. You're well adjusted. And I think that they realize it really was a job and it was a profession. But it took me to live all of this time for people to realize I really was telling the truth and it really was just a job. So hmm. for that, this is a, this is a proud moment for me. It's like I wish is the way it could have been 28 years ago, but it's not. It's it's now, and how lucky for me to hmm. have the opportunity to come out and say, "Howdy, y'all." <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to the person who stars in the scariest movie I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Remains that way very much. Nice, thanks. Good Thank to see you. you. Nice to yeah. see you too. Say hi to Dallas. All right. There you go. Hey, howdy, Dallas. Hey. <laughs> wow. Lots of questions. Mm. One is, does 11 minutes change a film very much for you? Yes, it, it, it totally changes the character of this movie. It gives it a moral center. It makes it more satisfying an experience, believe it or not. And it fills in a lot of you know, construction gaps that uh, maybe many people never noticed. But because of that, you know, the original version went from shock to shock to shock. Now it's whole. It's balanced, it's proportionate, and because of that, it seems even more realistic. And because of that, maybe some people who've seen this version say, even though we've only put in one scary scene back into it, that somehow all the other work makes the whole of it scarier. There were stories floating around during the making of this film about all kinds of weird phenomena happening, mm -hmm. which I assume were all not true. Well, you know, when you've been shooting for a year, uh, demons are a very useful 
uh, invention to invoke <laughs> for the cause of Especially delay. for publicity. Yeah. <laughs> well, Newsweek did that. <laughs> you know, what's taking you so long? Someone from Newsweek asked Billy, and he said, well, we've had all these f freaky phenomena <laughs> taking place, fire on the set, mysterious deaths, accidents, and whatever. I swear to you, this is how, how it grew. I mean, you, you shoot for a year, yeah. and you know, people do get ill, they get die, sometimes a fire starts, all that. There was only one thing that I thought was, uh, could have been considered borderline spooky. It's that uh, after one scene, which I was present one day, Chris Newman, our sound man mixer, is, uh, is listening to the playback. Now, it was a very quiet dialogue scene. And he's listening while the scene is being shot. And he'd heard nothing, but on the playback, he was hearing. And he played it for us. It was like chapter one, the mysterious rappings wow. began on the night of whatever. He didn't hear and John is dead was. or anything like no. that. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just want to make sure he didn't hear the yeah. Beatles tune backmasking on that. I never checked it for there that. There you go. There you go. Um, uh, sequels. Did you have anything to do with any of the sequels at all? Three. All of I them? wrote and directed. No, 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 no. The Exorcist Three. Right. I wrote and directed. That was based on my novel Legion. Um, were you as pleased with 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 what happened after the Exorcist as what happened with the original? I mean. After The Exorcist? Yeah, after the first one came out, and then, and then yeah. the sequels came out. Well, the second one was a notorious disaster, mm -hmm. uh, Exorcist Two. They wouldn't let me see it. I was living in Georgetown, and I was talking, I called Warner Brothers, the president, uh, Frank Wells, God rest his soul. I said, Frank, do you know, I have some connection with The Exorcist. Can I see it? He said, well, Bill, yeah, if you'll promise me that if you go on The Tonight Show and you don't like it, don't say anything about it. Frank, don't show it to me. So I, later in the week, I went down to the Bethesda Theater, you know, paid my two dollars at two fifty, and sat in the back with some friends. I was the first to giggle. I want you to know, I was the first to giggle, and then I giggled. I got some really outraged stares, people turning around saying, "You know, virtually blasphemous! Mm. How mm. dare you!" Mm. But as I had predicted to my family. At the point at which I'd circled it in the script, somebody smuggled a script to me. When Louise Fletcher put that helmet on Linda Blair's head, we went up and we never came back down. How about this for a line of dialogue from Richard Burton? I've flown this route before on the back of a grasshopper. Was it a locust or something? <laughs> Can you believe it? I asked them to let me remix it. I said, pull it out of the theaters. I will do a What's New Tiger Lily. I'll write a whole new story in subtitles. You know, we get rid of the track. Hold the story. Leave the picture. Don't we'll call it Son of Exorcist, whatever you want. There you go. Nice to see you. That's a great story. <laughs> My pleasure. Nice job in this. <sighs> Thank you. You know, I, I, it's an amazing experience watching this film because uh, uh, there seems to be so much love and care put into this film. Uh, it's tremendously so. I mean, it's almost... It's like, um, you know, when you first get a script, a lot of times, a lot of actors do this. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't speak for all actors, but you come through and look for your part. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know? And that was the first thing that I had done. I had a lot of other scripts. I was seeing how it just looked. And, and um, I found myself, well, just starting to read it, starting to read it. As a matter of fact, at the studio, we weren't allowed to take the scripts out. When we when we first when we first were brought into audition, we had to read them there, yeah. and we weren't allowed to take them out. So we really hush hush this project. So you think, ooh, now I really want to see my part. Yeah, now now yeah, let me see the part. And then I says, well, let me start, and I started reading it, and it was amazing because it was a real page turn. It was one of those scripts where, where I was I was counting the pages at the end to see like w when it ended, you know, because mm -hmm. I didn't want it to end, you know. What you find out watching the movie. Three hours goes by, you know, in incredibly fast. It's, um, you know, I mean, it was almost, this sounds wild, right? But it was almost like a little, a bit of a spiritual experience because it made you want to go find someone who you know has misunderstood you and you have misunderstood them and extend a hand in friendship and make an attempt to understand that person 
where they're coming from, explain where, where you're coming from, like a natural enemy. Yeah. You know, and that's that, that's what I got from it. And uh, there's a lot of forgiveness in this song. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Is this part you fought for? No. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, 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 let me explain something to you. I, I went. Uh, they originally had me reading for the part of um, Spivey. He was the character who who was you know basically torturing Kevin through yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, the real bad guy. Yeah, and, and Kevin drowned him. Right. Uh, Lieutenant Dunbar ended up drowning him. When I first read it, even though the actor did a wonderful job, I didn't like that part. I was fascinated with this part of Timmons, and they had been looking for someone. They said, well, Robert, the casting director, says, these are the people we're looking for, for, for Timmons. And they were all like about 60, 70 years old. Yeah. And I said, well, that's the part that I want to read. I don't think I really even want to. I, I, I just love this part. And who says he has to be young? Yeah. And they says, well, I said, OK, next time. And I was walking out. I was walking out. And she, and she called me back. She says, Robert, why don't you, she says, why don't you come in tomorrow and just read, read Timmons with Kevin? And I said, sure, fine. I think, as a matter of fact, someone said, it was between myself and Mickey Rooney. <laughs> so it's, Mickey was tied up. Yeah, Mickey was tied up. Just doing Andy Hardy He's returns. doing sugar babies again. <laughs> you know? But uh, it was just interesting to hear that. Well, it's a funny part, too, and it's, but it's a good part. And, yeah. And, and uh, you know, there are comic relief parts in movies that are always there for comic relief intentionally. And then there are movies that kind of transcend that, I think you said, yeah. where, where it's real fun and real interesting. Yeah, it was, um, you know, I, was, I, I have trouble sometimes watching myself on the screen. You know, it's a little too close. I go like, That's why it's not that bad. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't want him to move in with me, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but it's... Uh, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't probably buy him eggs on Easter. Oh! In fact, when the film br when the stopped last night, we all went and got eggs. You did, didn't you? We, we talked about it. But yeah, that was a running joke through the whole shoot. Robert, you want any eggs sent up to your room? <laughs> no, I have a piece of steak. You eat a lot of eggs on that shoot? Oh, uh, incredible. You know, I mean, what you see, I mean, you see sure. me eating a lot, but as we were shooting it, I must have ate like a dozen eggs in an hour. More than that. <laughs> you happy with Murphy Brown? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a great show. Yeah, it's a yeah. good show. And it's one of those shows that I think builds and gets better and better instead of dropping off. Yeah, that seems to be what's happening. That seems to be the way it's going. Like it's I get funny. each script you get is just, you know, more 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 than an extension of the other one. It just it moves into a different area each time. And it's one of those sitcoms that you're not like I never thought I would do a sitcom. You know, that was one of the furthest things from my mind when I first sure. you know, came in and started working. Uh but it's one of the ones that you're you know, proud to be a part of. It's not like, you know, I don't want to say some of them, but you know what I mean. Some sure. of the sitcoms are very, very fluff, you know. And, and this one, I mean, it deals with issues, environment we've dealt with. Just had an episode that dealt with, you know, freedom of speech, the First Amendment. And, um, yeah, it has something to say. And it gets a message across through a joke, Yeah. you know. Well, sm the smart ones do that. I yeah, think. smart ones do that. They sure do. Nice job. Hey. Yeah, good stuff. Nice meeting you. Nice to okay. see you in this film. Boy, I'm just really proud of you in this film. Oh, thanks. Yeah, and this is a real different film f for you than anything I've seen. Yeah, from you. Are you real aware of that? Yeah, it's uh, it's probably more you know it's a, it's a weightier film than any film I've done. Uh, there's the subject matter is, is weightier. I think it's more serious than films I've done before. But uh, uh, it's also I've never worked with that you know these many stars. And, and yet it's and, and yet I mean it, it's a message movie, but it's not really a message movie. I mean, I, more than anything, I walked out thinking, "Wow, this is just great drama." Yeah, this it's is most, great it's, fireworks. It's mostly just good theater. Yeah. I mean, the, the 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 theme of it, the moral dilemma of uh, when do you follow orders and when do you uh, draw the line, uh, is it's not like a message. It's just there. You know, it's right. just part of, of the fabric of the piece, and it's uh, it, it's it's a moral dilemma that's faced, uh, you know, people in the military since the beginning of time. I mean, it comes up, you know, we referred to it in the film, you know, with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Nazis at Nuremberg or, the, you know, the Cali at Niwai. I mean, this is something that is always a, uh, a, a tough 
a tough situation for the military. And, I, and I, you know, I, I look at Nicholson's character in the film, and I, I have some sympathy for him, knowing where he's placed in the job he has to yeah. do. And actually, when the tough going gets tough, he's the guy I'd probably like to have. That's right. And yet, I don't want him to get away with that stuff. No, I mean, yes, we, you know, just like he says in that speech, you want him on the wall, you need him on the wall, but at the same time, he has to play within the rules. Uh, and if he goes outside the rules and he, uh, you, uh, he abuses his power, then uh, uh, you, you, you can't have that. And you, you have chaos if, if that's allowed to go on. So uh, even though we need, uh, we need policemen, we need protectors, we need people to protect us, but we also want them, because they have such power, not to abuse it, to, uh, to really understand what the limitations are and where those... Uh, guidelines, where those guidelines have to be drawn. You know, I think people that go to the movies a lot, you know, I see probably 150 films a year, which is a lot. And, and so, and sometimes that's a privilege. Yeah, yeah. Not always, <laughs> not always. Uh, but, you know, you always wait for moments in movies that j just thrill you. And the last 30 minutes of this film are like that for me because it builds to that and it's written that way. Yes. To where, you know, they're not c scenery chewing, they're really exploding. Yes, yes. Well, what we've done is we've set the stage. I mean, the whole uh, piece is designed to set the stage for that last, like you say, 30 minutes. Um, we've established Tom's character and Jack's character, um, and we've established a David and Goliath type situation. You know, I mean, we've, it's, like a, it's like promoting a heavyweight fight. You know, you, you build it up to where you finally get to that point where now they're going to enter the ring together. Yeah. And you say, in this corner, you know, Colonel Nathan Jessup in this corner, you know, Lieutenant Daniel Caffey. And now let's, now let, let's get ready to rumble, you know, like we <laughs> watched last night with Riddick Bowen and, and uh, Vander Holyfield. I mean, let's, turn, let's get it on yeah. and see what happens. And, and well, these actors really rumble. I mean, they yes, really they fight. Do. Yes, they do. Yeah, they're both at the top of their game. I mean, I think it's the best thing Tom Cruise mm -hmm. has ever done in, in his life. And I think he would uh, he would agree with and that. He's done some really good. And he's work. done some great work. And he's he's real misunderstood, I think, by a lot of people. Well, I think first of all, he's he's so ha handsome and attractive, and he's got such great sexuality on the screen that you tend to discount his acting ability. Mm -hmm. He's a fantastic actor, this guy. I mean, you look at his work in in, in Rain Man mm -hmm. or Born on the Fourth of July, and now in this film, uh, he's he's a remarkable young actor. He's only thirty years old. Mm -hmm. I think that you know when he's when he's finished, he'll have an incredible body of work, and he'll take his place along with all the great legendary actors of all time. Do you? And I don't want to read into this too much, but when when you get material like this, do you do you live it through your own life? Because it's it's Cruz's character, somewhat of a, of a relationship with you and your father. Yes, it is. I mean, that's what drew me to the piece to begin with. I mean, I understand what that guy's going through. I've been through it. I know exactly what it, what it's all about, uh, and uh, that's what you know. Like I say, it's what. It, drew me to it. You feel like you're accomplishing what you want to do as a director now? Yes, yes. I mean, I think that, um, you know, because I didn't come up through the film school ranks, I probably am not as visual as I would like to be. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not to say that I'm not visual, because I think the films are visual, and, you know, and I think certainly I wouldn't have done this film any differently. It does have the exact uh, a visual technique that I wanted, mm. but if I was schooled in visual techniques, I would know, I would have more to draw on, so I would know what to throw away, what to not use. I feel like I'm limited in that I'm just, I'm, I've, in the seven films that I've made, I've gone through film school. I've learned in very, you know, uh, um, you know, on the job training exactly what the lenses do and, and how to utilize a lens and what light and when somebody lights a scene how that's going to translate to the screen how it's going to show up on film yeah. I've learned all that whereas a lot of guys know those things going in but then the positive part is that I've c coming through theater I have more of a sense of what the, you know what the acting is all about and how to stage a scene with the actors and so on oh, that's just it's a real confident film that's good oh thanks yeah. a lot oh, it's really yeah, great thanks Take me into the conversations that, that you had with the woman that you play. Did, did, Emily? Did, yes. Did, did you worry about 
meeting her for the first time and what that yes, asked her I and did. all anxiety over all those things? Yes, I did. I worried very much because also, because she lives in Argentina, it was impossible for me to meet her until after the filming. And we didn't actually meet until in Jerusalem. Wow. It happened to a few of us. And uh, I was very concerned. I was dying to pepper her with questions. But the extraordinary thing was when I met her, all those questions just fe fell away. It seemed like an invasion mm -hmm. in a strange way to ask her about personal details of her life. I didn't somehow want to be a kind of journalistic ghoul. And the only thing that you can hope as an actress is that you just embody the spirit of the person. And I was fortunate enough, I had a lot of research, and uh, I, had, um, I was able to see documentaries. And there were certain things, certain sides of her. She's this extraordinary ready smile, this love for life, um, and supreme intelligence, and uh, immense dignity. And those were the the, the roads I went down and uh, it was just a joy for me to meet her and she's here yeah. right now in, in oh, New fine. York as well so we've been spending time together. Let me ask you about her heart at the time. Yes. What kind of heart did she have? A great heart, a huge heart. Um, you know she was a privileged person um, and actually at the beginning of the war both she and Oscar were kind of keen on the Nazi regime because they were Sudeten Germans and so mm. when Czechoslovakia was annexed uh, it meant that uh, they were no longer a minority. And then they gradually realized what was happening. And I, she was never a fan of Hitler. Um, and uh, they also had some very good friends who were Jews when they were f children. Uh, it was a small community in Zvitar. And uh, increasingly, I think they just realized what was going on. And when they got the chance, they said, that we we're going to do something. And I don't know if they ne necessarily sat down and discussed it, because it was almost too dangerous to do it. They sure. just did it. Um, and she's been nicknamed Mother Courage by, by the survivors, and she really was. She uh, got food on the black market. She uh, helped run the factory, especially in Brinlitz. She uh, nursed uh, survivors uh, in the hospital, many who were frozen to death and would have died. Mm. Um, and she just said, well, I just, I just had to do it. I was uh, raised to believe that you, you can't tolerate injustice. Yeah. Mm. Mm. It's an amazing, amazing part. Woman. It's an amazing part. Thank you. Angel. Beautiful Angel. Take me into when you found out that your name was on the list. And I know that's You a see, I wasn't originally, I never was in Amalia. I was working in the plush of, in the garage as a welder. I learned this trade in about 15, 20 minutes, and I became a pretty good one. I don't know. Talent. <laughs> Now, I found myself because Oscar Schindler, I knew Oscar Schindler since 1939 when I was a escapee from the PW camp uh, train. Mm -hmm. And he came to my mother to try to redecorate it, his uh, new apartment. And I almost have a problem. You, read, you have to read the book and then you will sure. know a little bit more. Sure. And I tell you something, he influenced me so much, this man. Like we will say that I fell in love with this guy. He was, um, his voice magnetic. His behavior was extraordinary, highly intel intelligent person, knowledgeable, and a charmer. And he not, not only was a charmer towards the women, because they all love him, every one of them. And his wife adored him too, even that he have so many love affair. The love between him or her never expired. He loved her and adored her. But he was a man who loved to have, uh, to be surrounded with a lot of men, uh, women, sure. you see. And I don't blame him for it, you see. She didn't blame him <laughs> either for it. Because this was, she said, one, when they was asked about this, when he will have one woman only, I will be very, very jealous. But 100 women? How can be a jealous? You see? <laughs> so this is an extraordinary sit situation. Do, did the, when the people's names were put on the list, were they well aware of what it meant to be on that list? Yes. You see, when we were in the camp, we were talking quietly between all of us. Oh, I would like to get on the list to Schindler, to Amalia. Mm -hmm. This is a paradise there, compared to the camp, what we were in, in Plasma. And this still was not the worst one, because there were that camp and Auschwitz and other camps, but was quite similar because they used us as a slave labor and when you couldn't work, you were that pigeon, sure. you see? Now, when I found out, he tried many times till he succeed in the last minute when he made the 
complete 900 men. He put my name and my wife's name. I was married in 1940 together on the list hmm. because he knew me quite well for the whole period of time. And I was one of the last one but have a privilege to see him in Israel a few months before he died hmm. in 1974. Did he keep and that he, ring forever? I think so he did. Yeah. And not only this one, he talked to me that he would like to be buried in Jerusalem when we have the last meeting. I was a little bit surprised with his wish. You understand? Sure. And I even pulled a little bit uh, his leg about this. But then next day when I met Ichu Stern and, and Dr. Bieberstein and Jacob Sternberg and Dr. Moshe Beisky, those leaders in Israel, the Schindler Jews, they were also surprised, but they said, my God, this man is alive. What we are thinking were to bury him. But when he died in October 1974, two, three weeks later, with permission of Israeli government and German government, they exhumated his body and they brought him to Israel and buried him with a magnificent military funeral, and the film is in Yad Vashem from the fu mm. funeral, and the priests and two rabbis in the front. Mm, where he wanted to be. And he was buried in Jerusalem. Wow. But I think I read somewhere where you said it was time to do something commercial. Hmm, I doubt I'd ever say that. <laughs> I think you were saying it as a joke. Mm -hmm. um, Particularly with this movie, though, I did have a lot of reservations about doing something commercial and, and this sort of to this scale. I mean, they've always sort of been, uh, in my opinion, they've you know big epic sort of blockbusters have lacked a lot of content and, and weren't very character driven. I mean, and that's a stereotype, of course, but you know, for the most part, and you know, so I had a lot of reservations about about doing the, the picture initially. Um, but when I actually read the script and met with James and, and Kate, I realized that it was, had a lot of important themes and it was a, an immensely interesting story. Yeah. Was there a point, though, you were standing on, on that boat midway through the shoot or three quarters of the way through that shoot and you looked up and said, what, what have I gotten myself into? Absolutely. This is a story I've told a lot, but it's the truth that, uh, you know, we were, there was a, a weak sequence where we were on the poop deck, which is the back part of the ship. <laughs> Poop made you laugh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I've got a two-year-old and a five-year-old. Poop makes me laugh all the time. Go ahead. Well, we were, we were um, on this sort of hydraulic poop deck, and <laughs> we were cabled onto the back. And below us, there were like, you know, 15 stunt people on bungee cords bouncing off each other and bouncing off steel girders. And I looked up and, you know, uh, James Cameron was floating in on a giant crane with a close-up going past us to a green screen below us as the as the, the thing was on hydraulics moving back and notice I say thing yeah. and uh, you know there was like 20 cranes with lights around us and it was like the most unbelievable spectacle I've ever seen in movie making you know sure um, this movie already opened in Japan to uh, rave reviews and, and a lot of screaming young ladies who were yelling out your name as you were on stage I think I read somewhere that that night you said this movie made a man out of you. Mm -hmm. Can you explain? Oh, man out of me, man out of me. It took the man out of me. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's simply because it, this film goes through such a broad spectrum of things, and we, we did everything on this movie. I mean, it lasted so long. There's so many different levels to it. There's so many things we had to do that I don't think I could that this experience could ever be duplicated. I mean, it was my first time taking on something of, of this size, and, and uh, you know, it takes a lot of responsibility and you learn a lot. Have you been on a boat since the filming raft? No, no. Maybe a little boat. Actually, yeah, a little boat, a little speed <laughs> boat. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say, how long did it take to, to take a shower after that? I assume you didn't want to go into the water for some time after. No, I don't mind. I don't mind the water. What I do mind is being fully clothed in water. <laughs> that they don't mix. They're not good together. Yeah. If you knew then what you know now, would you still have done this film? Absolutely. Why? Well, 
uh, mainly because I, I I saw the movie and it's incredible. I mean, and I'll never you know this this experience I'll never forget. The film I'll never forget. Um, it's something that I I believe I you know took a chance with. I wanted to try something new, and uh, you know it definitely paid off. And I'm glad I did it. You know who's who's to say if I'll do something even close to like it again in the future? But uh, I'm glad I tried it. Very good. Appreciate your time. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, man. Very good. What does it actually feel like to suddenly be part of the most, you know, anticipated film of the year? Very, very, very bizarre. I mean, I imagine that what, and what it feels like to me is I'm sure what it would imagine, what I, what I would imagine it would feel like to any other person who works in a supermarket or works, um, you know, in a clothes shop, seeing yourself in a film, which I'm used to now, but for some reason, because it's so big, it's sort of like, that's me, what? How come I'm in this? I mean, it's a very, it's a very funny feeling, but also a, you know, a sort of a fabulous one at the same time. So, how did the part come your way? I mean, did 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 Jim Cameron look in the S to Z directory and look up Winslet, or did you go knocking on his door? I mean, well, what happened was I was working on Jude at the time and knew that I was going to be doing Hamlet, and uh, and I have a fabulous agent um, who is also a great friend in Los Angeles, and she she had read the treatment and thought, wow, you know. Kate's going to like this and uh, let's see what I can do. So she did a bit of knocking on doors and kind of barging through them. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I read the treatment and just loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, and then met Jim and things really went from there. But it did involve me phoning up Jim at one point saying, I have to do this, by the way. And, uh, you know, come on, because I know I've got the stuff. And I did a lot of that. I did do a lot of that because I don't. I sort of don't believe in just kind of sitting back and waiting for things to happen. You know, you have to. You have one life, and you have to make things happen. And um, you know, I tried my best, and it seems to have worked. <laughs> you make your own luck, you believe. Um, in many ways, I think you know. I think you do. I think you know. You can say. I mean, I, I say all the time in terms of my career, I've been incredibly lucky. Um, because I know that there aren't. You know, there aren't many British actresses, young British actresses, that work you know, in a consistent way, in the way that I have been able to. Um, but I do think that, you know, you, it, it is about hard work and, uh, and yeah, I think, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you, you are. And was Jim responsive to that sort of um, knocking yeah, on doors? Yeah, he was, he was. I think he kind of thought, because for him, Rose was always a strong young woman. Um, I think he, 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 he sort of realized that in casting me in, in that role, he would get a lot of that, um, and, uh, and that would come across in, uh, in, in the acting of the thing, and, uh, and uh, I hope it, hope it does. So obviously the, the, the story of the Titanic is, is one of the great tragedies and one of the great dramas of the 20th century, but what was it about Rose particularly that, that attracted you? I don't, to be honest with you, I don't think there was any one specific thing. I mean. What I would say as a kind of a general thing about her is that she's very much um, a free spirit underneath all of the, you know, the corseted, you know, lifestyle that she had been uh, living. But, um, and, and that's very much me, you know, I mean, that's very much part of what Marianne was about um, and what Juliet and Heavenly Creatures was about. And, uh, and that, that, that never fails to sort of strike a chord with me whenever I come across a role like that one. The way in which she is so excited about learning you know, and, uh, and, and becoming more worldly wise and seeing new things and traveling, and that's very much me. Um, and she loved, and she, she loved people, she just despised the people that she was, you know, she was um, surrounded by. Well, why is she so trapped? Is that the main reason? I think, yeah, she's so trapped, but she, I mean, she's so young, she's being forced into this marriage because she's a good person, because she feels obliged to marry this man um, in order to save uh, save her mother from having to become a seamstress, as she says in the in the, the famous what we call corset scene um, between the two of us, um, and that is really why she is so so trapped because she realizes that you know she's marrying essentially a death sentence because none of that would happen you know none of the things that she wanted to be able to do in her life she couldn't do them. What is it about Jack then that gives her hope? His I think his 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 free spirit his free spirit and his ability to see things and, 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 and want to see things um, for what they really are. And the reality that he had experienced in his life was something that she only fantasized about. 
and uh, and I think you know there were two souls that uh, that that met and worked and uh, it was something that I mean, it was something that, that I related to. I mean you know I've I've been I've been in that position before myself. I'm very lucky, um, and I think I think many people have in the world. That's a sort of intellectualization about the the attraction between the two of them, but the, the, there must be more. There's a bit of oomph there as well. <laughs> oh yeah, there was. I'm sure they fancied each other. Yeah, no, they did. I mean, of course, you know, that has to be that 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 was most definitely a part of it, on screen. Oh, you're very careful to say on screen. You're getting asked a lot of questions about. <laughs> uh, I am, of course. I mean, Leo and I. You know, we said at the beginning. We said, you know. We both know what's going to happen. You know, people are going to say, "Oh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet are now an item," and it's been there in print. And you know, people can say what they like. We were never anything but you know, really, really great friends. I'd do anything for Leo. You know, if he wanted me to be in Los Angeles tomorrow, and it was possible, I would get on a plane and I would go there. He's he, you know, he's very much um, a part of. I sort of feel a part of me in some way now. I mean, it was almost like I suppose a seven month relationship. We knew each other so well. I mean, sometimes we were spending 17 hours a day completely together and uh, and we just had a blast. We really had a very, very good time and he is so funny, that boy. He's very, very funny, which I think is something that people really don't know about, you know, Leo. He's um, highly amusing. It doesn't necessarily happen, though. You can spend 17 hours a day with somebody acting. And, and they can drive you mad. I'm sure, I mean, I haven't, I'm lucky. I really haven't experienced that. I've always had great relationships with the people that I've worked with. Um, but I would have to say that, you know, nothing compares to the relationship that, that Leo and I had. Um, and we, yeah, we were lucky. And it's something that Jim said, you know, he said, I'm so grateful for that, you know. So that, was, that was really a gift from somewhere that uh, the two of you got on so well and were there for each other. Because, you know, there were times when he would be, you know, hundreds of feet up in the air in a crane and we maybe wouldn't even see him all day um, on the shoot. He would be a, a voice or a loudspeaker and he hated that. Um, and was grateful, you know, that Leo and I could talk and keep communicating and keep doing our work, and uh, and he trusted us to do that, and um, you know that was a that was a tremendous thing. And you clicked as actors just as much as you clicked as people. Yeah, we really did. We really did. Do you know that the second you meet, it is just something in the eyes, some electricity. Well, I mean, I met I met Leo, and I thought, now, here we go. I'm sure he's going to think I'm a stuffy you know, Brit that's something out of Four Weddings and a Funeral and is going to start reciting Shakespeare. So I, I, I what I did actually was I, I was very observant um, of him really and his sort of body language and, you know, his kind of speech patterns and things like that. And I kind of, it wasn't that I tried to be like him, but I just tried to really be as relaxed and as overly, overly normal as I could be. Um, in order to make him realise that, you know, I wasn't going to sit there and say, you know, the lady doth protest too much, methinks, or something like that. And, uh, and he admitted later, he said to me, he said, you know, Katie Kane, that was what he used to call me, Katie Kane, you know, I, I thought that you were going to be like all English and you're not, you're cool. <laughs> and that was very, that was very, very early on. That was sort of, you know, when we, we were both doing it in the first week of rehearsals and and that was that was a nice thing to hear. The ultimate compliment. Yeah, because I was worried about it. You know, I thought, God, you know, I'm English. He's American. You know, my perception of what American actors doesn't really exist at the moment because I hadn't really worked with any. And uh, you know, I wanted to keep an open mind about that. And it was just <laughs> brilliant. I mean, it couldn't have been better. And another leading man, in a sense, in, in your fiance in the film, uh, Billy Zane. Yes. A, a, a equally good relationship there? Oh yeah, Billy is absolutely great. He's great. He's lots and lots of fun. He's a very focused actor and he loves, he loves to, um, to talk a lot and, and keep a kind of a dialogue going um, before you, you do scenes so that you're constantly sort of talk, just talking about, you know, the kind of emotional curves and, and things and, uh, and that, was, that was great, really great. A more unusual um, co-star in a way, although I know you didn't share scenes together, in Gloria Stewart. And Maybe yes. you'd explain, because I think you met her, didn't you, before filming started? Yes, I did. What, I, why was that, and what did that achieve, that meeting? Well, what um, happened was I, I, want, I very much wanted to meet Gloria because I wanted to observe some of her mannerisms and see if I could pick some of them up and, uh, and try and sort of put them into the young rose so that they would make sense in the old rose. Um, and when she was cast, and I've been told, you know, she was in all the Shirley Temple films, I thought, oh, God, you know, how fantastic. I've got to meet this woman. And so I went to her house and we had tea. And this is what happened. I walked in the door and she started telling me about how she'd been, you know, great mates with the Marx Brothers and things. And I was just out there with a wide open mouth going like that. I mean, it was like meeting a legend. And, um, and she said to me, now, would you like 
tea or juice or champagne. And I said, well, I have a glass of champagne. And she said, a girl after my own heart, like that. And so we sat there and shared a bottle of champagne at three o'clock in the afternoon. It was, it was great, really great. I was going to ask you how you prepared for the role, but I think I know that. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly wasn't lots of champagne drinking. No, it was lots and lots of hard slog and lots of reading of books. And I mean, at first I started off um, by studying, you know, what the ship was about and facts and figures and all of those kinds of things. And then I thought, actually, it's nice to know, but I don't really need to know that because Rose wouldn't have known that stuff. So then the swing, I mean, I was always going to, to, uh, to research um, the Philadelphian society and what her upbringing would have been like and doing my kind of usual thing, which is to think about what that person would have been like as a child and all of that. Um, but uh, much reading, much reading and sort of walking around with a very straight back and all of those things. And you had an etiquette coach, what was that about? Etiquette, we all had um, the etiquette coach, she was there, um, Lynn Hockney was just fabulous, I mean so wise and knowledgeable um, and fun as well. And that was really, I mean it was, it, you know, there is such a thing as etiquette and it is important especially with a period piece and especially with something like Titanic when you had you know, right across the board classes. Um, so it was an essential, an essential element, and she was there all the time. So you've done all that preparation, and then suddenly the reality of the thing is there. You step out onto that White Star dock and see that ship and those crowds. Mm -hmm. I mean, that must be an extraordinary feeling to, to walk into history. I can't tell you. It was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, we all, you know, everyone was fascinated. I mean, the makeup artists and the, 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 the costume people, I mean, everyone would just stand there going, I can't believe we're here, I can't believe we're here. And, you know, me most of all, I just was baffled by the whole thing. But uh, it was stunning, the work. I mean, the people that, I mean, the Mexicans and the Americans that worked on the set designs, construction. I mean, you cannot believe the work that went in. It was, uh, it was amazing, really amazing. And Jim's a real Titanic buff himself, I gather. He didn't, he dive? Yes, yes he did. He did, he did a dive down to the wreck. Um, I mean, I, I, I can't remember exactly when this was, but it was certainly now, about three years ago, and shot footage, the footage of, that you see in the film of The Wreck is the footage that Jim shot with his brother when they did this dive. We've heard stories of the shooting and various bits and bobs, some of them no doubt exaggerated, but what was the reality of shooting the action scenes? I mean, not easy, obviously. No, the reality of shooting action scenes was, I'm sure, the reality of shooting an action scene on any film. You know, they're hard work and you have to be very concentrated and it gets incredibly frustrating when, you know, lights aren't working in the right way and squibs aren't going off at the right time and the water level rises too much or too little. You know, so it's, it's very, very tough. But um, again, you know, I had Leo, I was fine because we just got on with it together and, you know, and, 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 and had fun with it. But, uh, but cold water, yes, long hours, yes. Um, but fantastic team of people, you know, like it couldn't have been a, a more um, supportive bunch of people to be working with and that really helped a lot. Scared though? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes I was scared, but then I would look around me and realise that there was nothing to be afraid of because the safety measures that were taken were, were extreme and of course Jim Cameron is a whiz at, you know, water work, he really is, so I never felt in any way that, you know, my god, I'm going to die. And, and, and contrary to what has been said and things, never did I did I really feel in any in any great danger. The few audiences that have seen the film all seem to come out surprised in some way by by, by what they see. Oh, good. They, oh, I, I'm expecting so and so, and it's more this or, <laughs> or whatever. You keep hearing, yeah, it's wonderful, but it's not quite what I thought. What do you think audiences are going to carry away from the film? What, what what do you hope they'll respond to? Well. I, I, I just hope that people connect with the love story side of it because that's what it always was for me. I mean, it was ne to me it was never another Titanic movie. It was some really something else. Um, and so I hope people walk away feeling moved by that. But it, it's it's I hope that people also feel things that they may never feel in any other areas of their lives, which is something that I always really care about um, through doing the job that I do is that you can touch someone in some way. Um, and they may not ever be touched in that way again. And uh, it's a, a sharing thing. But um, at the same time, it's 
tremendous. You know, I do think you feel uplifted in some way at the end as well because something is settled, something is laid to rest, and uh, you know that that woman is going on and did go on um, to have an extraordinary life and was very, very happy through the things that he had given her. And I think it says a lot about true love, you know. I mean, if you really, really love someone, the strength that they, that they give you through loving you is, um, is something that, you know, can always be cherished. Proud of the film and proud of the work? Yes, I have to say. <laughs> and it's, it's fabulous to sit there and, and watch it and go, God, I was a part of that. And it, it feels really, really, really great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm glad we're able to uh, do this interview and give you a little publicity. There, I haven't really because seen... nobody knows about this film. They haven't heard a damn thing about it. That's right. <laughs> so I'm glad we're there for well, you. Well, nothing good so far, anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, some in there, yeah. And, and well, that's the good thing about being able to do interviews today in the way you can clear up some of the things that weren't so good and say, well, try to dispel the myths. If yeah. You can. What are some of them? What are the What are some of the ones that you say that's that's totally inaccurate? Uh. Well, you know, people have been reporting the budget as much higher than it is. The budget is, in fact, uh, just a little under $200 million, but they've been saying it's $285 million, which is ridiculous. I don't usually, I've never historically copped to the budget. But it's it sort of bitten me because people think True Lies cost $120 million and it cost $100 million. So I, mean, I figure I might as well get the facts straight. Um, I don't know. I mean, people have, have had, uh, there have been a lot of rumors about uh, safety on the set. Mm -hmm. and the, set the set was very safe. And you know we have the we have the facts to back it up, but these rumors kind of spread like wildfire. It, it, it's something to do with the big the big film syndrome, you yeah. know. Sure. Let's talk about the pitch. You started this with the simple pitch at 20th right. Century Fox. Right. What were what was the pitch? Little movie, boy meets girl. <laughs> a ship sinks, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> More on that later. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So you you pitched this as kind of a Romeo and Juliet. On yeah, you could you could put it that way, uh, exactly on on Titanic, and you know I had I had this book of these beautiful paintings done by Ken Marshall, who later worked with us on the film, uh, showing showing the ship in it, in its glory and it, during the during its death throes, and and uh, I hadn't even written it yet, but I'm saying okay, there's this guy and there's this girl and he's an artist, and you know it was all up here still, and um, and they said yeah. Yeah, okay, let's, let's go to the next step. So then it's write the script. And uh, when they got the script, it was one of those things where it's like, ooh, oh, I really love this script. And ooh, this is going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And they were right. Yeah. Was there a point where they go, well, couldn't we have like, like, a, like an Arnold or a Terminator coming on board and, you know, pulling no. the passengers off and going, yeah. I'll be back? And, yeah. Because that'll, that'll really pump up the box office potential. Well, no, you know, I mean, there was no, there, there was no attempt to kind of, crank it up or turbocharge it, you know. Uh, Peter Chernin uh, is quite a literate guy, mm -hmm. fortunately. He knows how to read a script and he appreciated the writing. Uh, so he was always a strong supporter of the film. But it was a tough business decision to make this film. You know, no sequel, but it's not a sequel, you know, it doesn't have a built-in audience. Yeah. Uh, no sequel potential, you know, so no, no franchise value if you do have a hit. Um, you know, you can't make a theme park attraction out of it. You can't do a toy line out of it, you know. So all of those other profit centers don't exist. So it really has to stand on its own merits. It's a period movie, a period romance. Nobody's even made that sort of film much, certainly not on that scale. budget scale, you sure. know, for a long time. So it's really a throwback. And when I pitched it, I said, this is a throwback. This is the kind of film that hasn't been made in some time. So let's, you know, if you don't have the courage to do that, let's not play. Um, and they did, you know, and, and it's a tough call. Yeah. How would this film have been different if it had to have met its release date of July 4th or the end of July? It would have been a, a good film that was a little bit longer and not, not as well refined, not as well polished in the cutting. Uh, some musical moments might not have been quite as powerful because the music was sort of, you know, it, it took a long time to, to record the music and get it just right. Um, just, it, it would have been a good film, but not the film you saw. Yeah. yeah. And that music is haunting, I mean, it, all, the, all the way home. Um, the experience of going, I think somewhere I was quoted, he got to go to Mecca when you mm. got to go down yeah. to the wreckage. Yeah. What kind of impressions did you take away from that? Well, you know, you think it's going to be one thing, and it turns out to be another. Mm. You know, I expected it to be eerie and haunting and spooky and, and, and evocative and all that sort of thing. But what I didn't expect was to feel this kind of pit of my stomach 
impact of the of the pain and the loss and the and the and the sadness that happened in that place. And it's a very hard thing to explain because, of course, I should have known that. I'd done the research. I'd written the script. I I had thought that I had made my kind of emotional connection to Titanic and to the event. But going to the wreck was a whole order of magnitude greater, you know. And I'm not ashamed to, to, to say that, that I cried after the first dive when I got back to the ship and just sort of let it, let it hit me and wash over me. And maybe it's what I did know and the history that I knew and the people that I, that I knew were, were on the ship. Uh, but, you know, in, in having done that then, I felt, okay, now, now I have something that I can communicate to the actors, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that, that every time an actor came in, whether, it's, whether, whether it was Kathy Bates or, or, or Kate or Leonardo, I, I had something to say to them that piqued their interest because they saw this now, you know, maybe they read the script and thought disaster movie, but now they're talking to me and they're hearing something different. You know, and I think it guided the film in a, in a slightly different direction. I'm not saying I really changed the script, but it was really more a question of emphasis and, and, and the, the emphasis we put on things. Mm -hmm. you know. I'm not ashamed to admit I, I welled up during the movie as well. So. Well, that's Thank good. You. Thanks that's for good. your time. 90s, 90s guy. And we are. That, yeah. you, know? you know, I see movies on, uh, on a high level pretty often. You, you know, you go to the movies and every year there's a handful of films on a really high level. But I've had two, two film-going experiences, and not to patronize you, because I, I wouldn't do that, uh, on a whole different level, Schindler's List being one and this being the other one, where you walk into a room and you really don't have questions as good as the film. But I have a lot of ideas I want to explore with okay. you. One is the question that people who will pay a ticket to see a movie will ask themselves, can I take this? Can I take this film? Because I've heard that it's tough. Mm -hmm. That's the question they're going to ask, and I've seen the pictures. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? I would just say to them that that is a decision that they're going to have to make based on what they've heard about the film. If they have any doubt that they might not be able to take the level of, of reality inside the, the, the sequences of battlefield combat, they should wait until somebody else they trust sees it first, who knows them well enough to say, you know, I think if you close your eyes in four or five places, you'll be okay, or I, this isn't the right film for you. Go see something else. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the perception of movies is different than what it really is. I still meet people who will not see Schindler's List because they don't think they can take it. A lot of times they're women, and I don't mean that as a sexist comment, but they are. They just don't think they can take it. And yet the perception of Schindler's, the reality is it's about saving 2,000 people mm -hmm. and not killing them. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes the perception of this film, although I think it is a little tougher in mm -hmm. some ways. It is. But that's what's important about it, because it, 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 it doesn't patronize the audience and it tells the truth about combat. Yeah. Like I could have played it really safe and told just another World War II story filled with thrills, spills, and action and adventure. That would have been very easy for me. I did that in one's called Raiders of the Lost Ark, where the enemy was the Nazis, and another one called Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, where yet again the, the enemy you know, was World War II. And, and I couldn't do that in this case. I had too many people who fought that war, wanting me personally to tell this story the way they experienced the war, not the way Hollywood has told us or informed us what combat was like. There's been very few films that have really been about combat. One of them was, was Platoon. Mm -hmm. And another one, in a strange way, was the early Lewis Milestone film, All Quiet in the Western Front. Mm -hmm. Now, in between those two movies, there have been other examples uh, of moments in Battleground are amazing, moments in Walk in the Sun, moments in They Were Expendable. But for the most part, war was meant to glorify. Th therefore, by glamorizing combat, you glorify the, the heroes that fought those wars. And that was done for a reason back in the 1940s. And that was basically done to make people at home feel that the boys who were dying, your sons who were dying, were dying for a, a, a very great, important, necessary cause. And that was a noble thing to do. And that was a noble thing to do then. It served its purpose. Those were propaganda films. But they started a trend of World War II movies, and very few films, except for films, films like that story of G.I. Joe or Steel Helmet, that, that veered off course and told their own truths about that war. Most of the pictures used the war as a commercial springboard to make money about, to profit from, from that war and other wars. And that's not was not my intention or our intention when we made Proud of Ryan. Was your intention to show it as close as you could to how it really was, especially in the opening 23 minutes of this film? I, I think if I showed uh, this movie, if I if I actually shot this movie as close to 
how it actually was, I could not have released the movie. I would not have found theaters that would have accepted the movie, and I would have gotten an X rating. Forget an NC-17 or an R, it would have been an X rating. Mm -hmm. What it re really was like was an X-rated war. All war, Vietnam, Korea, World War II, every war is an X-rated war. I did have a line that I drew in the sand, so to speak, of Omaha Beach, that I didn't cross. I got up to the line, I never crossed it. People may see the film and say, well, he crossed the line for me, and that's fine in their judgment, in my own judgment, which is why I can live with myself, I didn't really put on film all that I could have put on film about war. But it is pretty damn close. When you, how, do you, how do you honor veterans? Do you honor them by telling the truth or by glamorizing or romanticizing or just by showing, showing the way it was, showing the way it is? I just think, you, you, it just in all honesty, you show all the honesty. And the honesty meaning that the death comes quick, and when it doesn't, you know, you suffer, and and you lose your best friends, and then you make new ones, and you lose them, and uh, and then you're going on a mission that you don't think is right, that you think is immoral, that you don't think is a fair thing mm. to be asked to do. At the heart of the story, really, is the morality play of is it right to save Private Ryan, who has a mother to return home to, but these eight guys might not be around to return home to their moms because the War Department has decided to do something humane. Um, maybe it's a public relations mission they're on, but they, are, they all argue about it. The larger context of this movie is World War II and the Normandy invasion, but the story and what really made me tell it, want to tell it, was that those moral questions. Is this a film that you would invite all World War II veterans to see? Yes, I would, but the same th I would say the same thing to the World War II veterans that I said to the Holocaust survivors when I made Schindler's List. That is, many of you will find it harder to watch this movie than, you know, unseasoned, un you know, soldiers who never fought a war and don't know what combat's like. The, the toughest audience to get into a theater to watch this movie is actually the audience I made the picture for, which is the veterans. And it might be too tough for a lot of them. As Schindler's List was, in, in many cases, too tough for the actual survivors of the Holocaust to, to see. You've made a film that really doesn't comment. It just shows. It's not a film about beating you over the head with a message. You know, Tom Hanks' character has a, a, kind of a pretty good dark side going yes, on. Yes, he does. Yes. Considering the circumstances, it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. But it's not about commenting. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yes, I do, very 100%. What you Editorializing in a movie is what most movies are all about. And you see so many movies every year, you know that almost every scene has an editorial parenthetical comment from the writer or the director, you know, that kind of hmm. explains and justifies the existence of the scene of the picture. And there's, there's a lot of, and, and, and that's, just, that's just storytelling. That's just good storytelling. But, you know, I think there's a good story to be told here, but I didn't want to editorialize it all. I wanted to let the audience do the editorializing. I didn't want to do that for them. Did you end up with the film you set out to make? Yes, I did. I ended up with the film better than I set out to make, which, you know. Does that surprise you? Yeah, yeah. So that surprises me that you yeah. would say that. Yeah, because, because I made the movie in continuity. And by simply shooting the movie in continuity, starting in the Higgins boats and ending on the, at the Memorial Cemetery, you know, in France, um, the movie told me what it needed to become. Every single day I was informed and reinformed how far to go, where to take it, and what to tell the characters, and how to rewrite the script. And, and I hadn't made a movie in continuity, my goodness, since E.T. It's been a long time since I made a picture in continuity. Yeah, a lot of times just shooting, it doesn't make sense. You know what happens a lot of times in the movie, is you shoot the, the, the last scene, the, 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 the love scene, the ultimate kiss first, right. and you shoot the beginning last, and you shoot the middle all over the place. That's, that, that's an economical. Uh, consideration uh, when you're watching your budget. I watched my budget on this picture very carefully, but I did shoot it in continuity. When you watch Tom Hanks in this film, in your film, he speaks volumes a lot of times without saying anything. I find him more mature in this mm -hmm. film, maybe it's because the character is playing, than anything I've seen him in. He's a very mature human being yes, he is. with a lot of responsibility. Yes. What jumps out about him in this film for you? Um, just, just that, you know, he has a hidden agenda, and we trust there is one because Tom Hanks. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know, always has has had one. I think people trust Tom Hanks, the at the the personality. But I think the amazing thing about Tom Hanks is 
he is such a chameleon as an actor. He can play all these different characters, from the character in Philadelphia, to Forrest Gump, to, to the, 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 you know, the young boy in Big. I mean, I mean, he is such a actor of a thousand faces. And, and yet, there is something inside Tom that whether he chooses to show us what's inside of him from film to film, we just trust that, that there's a constant there that makes us comfortable watching him. It's a constant in all of his roles. There is one person there we can trust. I ask you a question. It's a little more introspective about directing. If you took away any sense of income or publicity or notoriety about what you do and it just gets down to the moment of doing it, of making a film, of directing, of working on that set and editing, what do you really love about what you do? I mean, what, what, what phase of it do I love? No, just I guess in your heart. What do you really love about making films if you didn't make a dime doing this? I tell you, the thing I've always loved about making films is that you start with nothing and you wind up with something. Sometimes you start with nothing, you wind up with nothing, too. <laughs> but, but you aspire to wind up with something. And I love the idea, especially with original stories, of pulling something out of thin air and in a year it's somebody else's reality. And, and, and that is the endorphin high that I need to keep doing this job, which I love to do. Was there ever a time where you considered not making films after you started? No. Well, yeah, when I was making Jaws, I figured life's too short. Wow. I was such a bad Been experience. Been books written on that, <laughs> exactly. Hasn't there? That was the only time I really thought about quitting and going into something else. But when I realized I knew, didn't know how to do anything else, I realized I would just have to recover from it. Do you find directing as fulfilling now as when you started? More. Why? The older I get, because now I'm able to pick and choose my projects. Um, I don't, I don't mean I didn't ever have that right before, but now that I'm older and I've got seven children and they're all grown up and they're all requiring different things of me, I'm much more interested in stories that they need to know about someday. Not now, because I wouldn't show them Ryan now, they're too young. But someday, you know, I'd like them to see my last three movies, which they haven't seen yet. Mm -hmm. My father was on three ships in World War II. Two of them were sunk. He was a survivor twice. He was in the Pacific Fleet, Guadalcanal, mm -hmm. and some right. of the big Pacific theater. Um, my brother died in Vietnam when I was 15, was bit by a mosquito in Saigon and died of encephalitis. And I'm a sole surviving son. That law kicked in for me because I was the last year of the draft. Wow. Thankfully, I had a high number I didn't have to go anyway, but right. lower number, that would have kicked in. So there's a, there's a connect, connection. But the, after seeing Private Ryan, the first thing I thought of is, is to go back to my hotel room and call my father mm -hmm. and say thank you. It's a very simple mm -hmm. gesture. It's not about talking about it mm -hmm. or dialogue, but it's about... Because I think I think your film crosses the lines from just those that worked in the European mm -hmm. theater as well as everybody. Yeah. You, you speak volumes to them. It's kind of a responsibility. You feel a responsibility. I feel, I feel responsibility to talk to you about it right here. You know, and and I feel a real duty to what my dad did for me to give me the life that I'm giving my children. And I really made this film to say thank you to my father and to all the veterans that fought in that war. And not just that war, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody that ever fought and died or f and fought and lived, you know, you know, in all these wa wars, many of them sadly needless, and a few of them essential, like the Revolutionary War, World War II, essential wars. But, um, I, you know, my whole thing is I used to drive by, we, there's a memorial cemetery in Westwood. I used to drive by it every day and never looked at it. It didn't mean, didn't mean anything to me. And then as I grew up and I got a little more conscious and self-conscious about what I wanted to give to my kids, and when I made something Private Ryan, what I hope people would do is next time they drive past a veteran cemetery, they just look at it and just very quietly say, you know, thanks. Because I don't think we really realize what World War II could have become had the outcome been slightly different. Isn't it amazing, too, the responsibility that if you make a bad film about World War II that it doesn't really honor yeah. them? No, it doesn't that honor them at all. the importance is to do it well? Yeah, yeah. You feel that when you were shooting this? Yeah, I felt like I, I, I felt, I think what pushed me to, to make this story graphically honest was that I felt that I didn't want to be just the caboose on a long train of war movies, you know, spanning 60, 70 years of Hollywood history that, that used their sacrifices to kind of support the adventure and the glamour of war. And I, f I find there's no glamour in war. You know, you talk to anybody from Vietnam, Korea, or World War II, and, and, and they get very upset with you if you t tell them that your favorite film was The Sands of Iwo Jima. Yeah, well, 
most of them, most of the stories that they tell are unspeakable. They still can't do it. Thank you. Thank you. Man, good conversation. It was a great conversation. Yeah, I love that. That was the best conversation of the whole hey, day. Hey, Stu. Man, I, 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 every once in a while you see films, I, I, I can count them on one hand in the last 18 years where I don't have words for as good as the film. Wow, well, excellent. Yeah, that's how I felt about it. I mean, I'm, you know, and I can say that just because it doesn't have anything to do with me. You know, it's Spielberg and Hanks and, um, and what they did I thought was just so amazing that it's just the kind of thing I'm just really proud to be in it, you know, and just have any part in it. You know, and it, you know what's great about it is that it, 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 in its simplest form, it really honors those guys. My father was on three ships in World War II, sunk, two of them sunk, was a survivor both times. Jeez. Lived his whole life with a piece of shrapnel on his back from Guadalcanal. And, and it makes you want to just say thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And and as an actor, it's it's you know that's the daunting task is to play a guy and and, and feel like well, you know you, you enter into it with such a sense of responsibility to those guys, mm -hmm. um, um, because there's no way we could ever understand really what they went through and the courage it took to do what they did. But um, but as you say, to just try and honor that as best we can, you know that it's a tremendous sense of responsibility for me going into it. As an actor, is there a sense, and I'm reading into this, and correct me if I'm wrong, of being really in the moment a little more than unusual in a film like this because you're surrounded with such such amazing things? Yeah, yeah, well, it's it, it, it's easier because at, at like on this set, there, at, the attention to detail was so incredible that every single thing that you could really be consumed by that world because in, in the town that we were in, you could walk into any store and but it would be bombed out, but there would be this, it would, it would be an actual store. I mean, you could, any, any, you could see every single detail, every single molding, everything was exactly there. You know, sometimes uh, in movies, um, you go in and, you know, it's just the storefront, you know, and there's mm -hmm. just nothing behind it. And you go, okay, well, we can't put the camera there. But Stephen creates a world where, where he can take his camera anywhere because he never knows where he's going to want it to go. So. Kind of when you won the Oscar for writing, and um, when all that happened with the Oscars and stuff, when we watched you on TV a lot right. at that point, right. um, it was it was kind of a celebration, I think, for a lot of us that recognized good writing and good quality, and and well, w w that seemed like a good time for you. Postscript now, is it a good time for you? Yeah, I mean it's great. What, I mean it's beyond anything we ever thought. Uh, ben and I wanted to um, just get some work, you know, and and. To, you know, make a, a movie that we were proud of and then hopefully get some work afterwards. And um, to have everything happen that happened was just, it, it just kept getting more and more ridiculous. Um, just in terms of what was, ha what was happening, we, you know, we, we did everything from going to the Oscars to actually like meeting the president at one point. And it was just, at that point, it just was insane. It was, it was beyond a dream come true. It was like a dream within a dream. Most people, are, most people or a lot of people that write something wonderful and that, that is well received like that have many ideas in their heads. Do you have a number of ideas rolling around in your yeah, head? Yeah, we have some other ones. That, that, you know, it always comes down to execution and, and to do it right we need a lot of time to work on it, which we used to have uh, in abundance. That was the one thing we had was time. But, um, but now, fortunately, we've become more busy as actors. So um, the you know, the trick will be finding a way to, to get together and, <clears throat> and do something that's, you know, not just a follow-up to, 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 to write something else or because there's pressure to write something else, but something that's really uh, worthwhile, you know. Last question. If you take away any sense of income or publicity or notoriety about what you're doing, it, and it really just gets down to the moment of doing it, right. what do you really love about acting? Whew. That's a really hard question. Um, the, the challenge is... There are so many challenges to it, and it changes constantly. And the challenges change constantly, depending on what you're doing and uh, who you're doing it with. Um, to me, it's not only going to these amazing places, but meeting the people. Uh, the people that uh, I've been so lucky so far, and, and, and the people that I've been able to work with. Uh, it's just it's, it's the constant learning, you know? It's instead of going to the same place every day, and doing the same thing, I go to a different place every day and do a different thing with people who um, I feel really fortunate to even have any contact with. So that's probably it. Mm. Nice to see you. I'm really yeah. proud of you, man. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Hey, amazing film.
Thank you. I'm just, you know, I don't have questions as good as the film, so but we'll, we'll do the best we can here. <laughs> and actually, I do my job for films like this, so it's, it's part of the good part of the work. I guess I want to explore the film through your eyes as an actor, and then every once in a while you get to do a role where, where it looks from an audience standpoint that that's easier to get lost in the moment because you're in the moment in this film, that, that you're recreating moments that are kind of bigger than life and huge and profound. So when you hit the beach and, and you do those, those scenes coming off the boat, well, you can't what's that like through your eyes? Well, you, you can't think about it in like momentous kind of things, you know. It's a, for me, uh, it's a simple of how do I get off this boat and get to that beach because this boat's not making it to the beach and we're under fire and we got no covering fire and we got no, you know, they decoded us. And they, the, the first 5,000 guys who went in, 18 survived. It was a slaughterhouse. Um, and what I was dealing with as an actor was just, what's next? Okay, Cat Miller, Cat Miller, I'm over here, I'm behind this, now what? Get those men on your butt and get to that seawall. Now that's easier said than done, but we get there. Now, only 18 of the first five grand got there. The other guys were slaughtered. They intercepted our planes, got them in dog fights. They got our big boats in fights with their big boats. So we had no covering fire. I mean, Tom's character at one point says, where in the heck is everything? Where is everybody? And I scream out, we're right where we're supposed to be to what nobody else is. So through my eyes, um, it was just a matter of carrying out what I would, carrying out my orders, getting as many men safely to the seawall as I could, and without getting myself killed. But knowing that I'm probably going to die. Um, and when we get there, I mean, there is a sense of great relief that we're at least underneath the pillboxes above us, mm -hmm. that we are, for the moment, we're safe. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Eisenhower wrote a letter of concession that we've been beaten. Um, and in the history books, it's been destroyed, and no one's seen it, but he does admit to a, have started composing it. Wow. And um, the history books, it's like D-Day was just like this, hey, we just walked on the beach, and yeah. bang, 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 and, and it was ours. Mm. In point of fact, it was a 72-hour fight. I don't know if you've ever been to Omaha Beach, but no. I've been there. I went up there and just one row of white crosses after another. 90% of them 19 years old. 90% right. of them had never seen battle before. And to go into that kind of storm of horror, you know, hmm. the movie speaks for itself. Yeah, it does. You've seen the film, haven't you? Yeah. I saw it once. Pick a moment that that profoundly pleases you the most. Well, um, I have a couple. The scene in the church and the scene on the bridge. There's scenes when Tom and I are by ourselves. Yeah. Um, I love the scene in the church. Just a simple question where I go to him, hey, John, are you all right? I love that little moment where he goes, there it goes again, there it goes again. And I go, mm -hmm. and then the Vecchio thing and the V and stuff, and then it ends up with me saying, are you all right? A very simple declarative sentence question, a very simple question. And then the beach, I mean, and then the um, scene on the, the bridge, when we have fulfilled our mission, we have found him. But you know what happens, and I can't give it away. And then Tom and I, you know, he's very bewildered. <clears throat> and it's I, Sergeant Horvath, who convinces him to do what we then do. Um, those two moments for me personally, um, I, I think are, are, are very, very important moments in the movie. Um, 
and also I think just the D-Day sequence itself, just the 23 minutes of that mayhem is uh, it kind of, uh, that's the way it was. You know, we've cut that footage into some documentary footage and guys can't tell the difference, yeah. the guys who were there. Right. I'm I proud of you. I'm talking to Steven yet, but I'm very proud of that. You know, as an actor, I mean, you can work your whole life and never have an experience as rich as this. Is that, am I overstating? No, we all knew. You know, I mean, you knew from day one that we were a part of something special, something that was going to have uh, his, uh, historical significance. And when we wrapped, um, Tom, Tom Hanks took us around back of the, the church where, where we had the last scene, uh, along with Captain Dale Dye, the military advisor, and he said, look, you know, uh, a generation from now, people are going to, you know, come up to you and say, what was it like to be a part of that film? You know, we had such a sense that we were a part of something uh, that's bigger than, than us in the movie business. I mean, I don't know if that's overstating it, but um, that's kind of how we felt. So I, don't, I, I can't imagine I'll ever have an experience that, uh, that could duplicate this. You know, I have, I have a movie going experiences. I see 350 films a year, and I, and I really just review films and interview every once in a while, and I, 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 I really do my job for films like this because in its simplicity, in its complex simplicity in the making of the film. It's a very simple concept and it, and it has so much dignity to it that, yeah. that, that, that I leave wanting to thank all of my parents and grandparents who fought in that war. Well, we were saying, you know, I mean, a, a great thing we got was, um, you know, mentioned Captain Dale died before. Mm. Before we started shooting, when we were at boot camp, he said, look, you guys represent uh, my fraternity, you know, the fraternity of soldiers. And you represent everyone uh, that has died for this country, and everyone, more importantly, that died on the beach on June 6th. And he said, I'm not going to let you disgrace their honor. You guys are going to be soldiers, and you're going to do the right thing by them. And that was a real eye-opener for us. And from that point on, I think all of us said, you know, we really have a responsibility here to do the right thing by all of, the, all of those men. You know, it's really interesting. You can be as earnest as you want to be and still make a bad film. But there's a difference here. What's the difference? I, I, I'm going to say I think Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. Um, and, you know, they care so much, uh, cared so much about this material. Uh, just watching them on the set, you know, I learned so much as an actor and a filmmaker or as any, uh, any part, anyone who's part of the filmmaking process, they're uncompromising. They never give up. They always want to make sure is this the best way we can do it? And is this honest? Is this accurate? Are we being truthful? Hmm. Uh, that was the most important thing that was being said on the set. Um, I, I want to vicariously live through you for a minute, but that, that opening, the opening scene where you, you get off the boat is a, a defining moment in, in history, especially in war history. But as an actor, what was that like? You know, my character, I... I, my stuff was picked up, I didn't actually jump off the boat, so I didn't have that moment, except when we did training, we had to do it. Um, so I can only speak of, you know, sort of the walk or, you know, yeah, it really was a walk across the beach, which was one thing that I, I found strange from the research is they said, when guys got off the Higgins boats and actually got onto the, the sand, nobody ran. There was such a sense of shock, these guys had, that they just kind of walked towards towards the bluff there. Um, for me, you know, you got some sense, I think, of what it may have been like. And, and there's no way for anyone who, who's never, who never served during wartime to know what, how horrific and frightening that must be. But, you know, you would do those scenes and you're firing your weapon, which is very loud. There are explosions going off. There's blood all over the place. Stuntman is flying by. Your arms are flying by. Uh, you know, explosions are going off and you're getting hit in the face with stuff. So you definitely forget that you're on a movie set and you are scared. I mean, you don't think you're in a war, but you're scared. So I can, and your blood is pumping and the adrenaline is going. Um, so that's as close as I think any of us got. You know, we, we experienced some kind of fear uh, and there was no real life threat. Um, so, you know, you'll, you'll, we can never know. You, no movie... Uh, either acting or uh, watching experience is going to, you know, touch on what, how horrific that must be. I'm really proud of you.
Thanks. Nice job. Thank you, Ben. Very nice. Thanks. Good to see you. Nice job in this film. I mean, I don't really have questions as good as the film. Mm -hmm. You know, it's profoundly amazing. My father was in World War II, was in the Navy fleet, uh -huh. so he fought at Guadalcanal, uh -huh. was on three ships, two of them were sunk, so he was a survivor both times. And I've gone through his diary with him, and I'm pretty well versed on the war and, uh -huh. and things. And at the same time, I, my first thing after the film, I just wanted to call him and say, you know, thank you. Uh -huh. You know, and because in a way it really honors him. Uh -huh. Sure, sure. You have that in the back of your mind when you're playing soldiers, knowing that a lot of them are still, you know, a lot of them have died, but a lot of them are still walking around. Oh, yeah, it was very necessary in our preparation, something Stephen was adamant about, Stephen making sure that Captain we... Stephen Captain Dye, the, you know, our military advisor, you know, Thank made you. it real clear that that was what we were doing, you know, don't just give a good performance, but... Um, make sure we don't look like movie stars or, you know, actors coming out of our trailers and looking rested and whatnot. Yeah. It's uh, meant to be a, a respectful representation. So, I mean, yeah, I hope that's what it is. I mean, and, sure. Yeah. Have you guys seen the film? Yeah. yeah. All the way through? Yeah. Um, um, I'm curious through your eyes. I think I understand from my father, and I understand a lot from the film and, and a few other films uh, on a high level, of what combat is like in my own little small world. Right. But as an actor, what is it like? Well, it, it, it ends up, um, a, a, again, it's like you can read as much as you want, you can research as much as you want about um, the subject, but not until you have, you know, sort of 40 pounds of pack on your back and you're holding a your rifle and um, you're trying to, 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 you know, to sort of make, make your way through this, uh, you know, this bloody beach, you know, that you have um, a real visceral sense of what it might have been like, which was horrifying, chaotic, confusing, and, um, and really just rattling. And, um, and there's very little acting in, is involved when it, comes, when, when it comes down to that sort of uh, thing. You know? mm. Just shooting a blank. Just one blank with your rifle is, is really disconcerting. I mean, just the shock of that, hearing that for the first time, when you add others and, and realize that, you know, it's also coming at you and there's things yeah. blowing I mean, up. when we would do, we would do a, a night maneuver in boot camp and it was the first time you'd really see, like, the muzzle flash, you know? Yeah. And the muzzles, you know, you were, it was an, uh, 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 some uh, maneuver where we were meant to be ambushed and practice kind of a maneuver where you fall back. And, um, you know, and there were like six or seven muzzle flashes all at once. And it was, you know, I mean, I, that's the, one of the most disturbing images I've ever seen. You know there are blanks in there, but it doesn't matter. I mean, and, 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 and now you get the sense, you know, of what this must have been like. And what it was like was a nightmare. I mean, nothing short of a horrible, horrible nightmare, you know. Yeah, you, it's, it's, it's to realize that what you're, what you're experiencing, as, as terrifying as it was, just actually... Being in the, f I mean, actually being in the combat in the film, it's it's this frightening. But to realize that it doesn't begin to approach what they were actually feeling, that you know, sure, uh, it's. You play a character with an, an enormous sense of guilt. In in a sense, there's a, there's a point where he's frozen. Yes. And and I would imagine, maybe I'm reading into it, but that there's a lot of guilt that goes along with that. Maybe later. Sure, sure. But uh, that's I appreciated that, and that Stephen with. With all the characters, he, he didn't want to portray anyone as anything less than human. And the truth of you know uh, of war is when you you can get the strongest man who's who's performed really well in training, get him in the middle of combat and he's paralyzed. You know that's that's the truth. So my character further wasn't you know was supposed to be in combat at all, and so to be thrown in the middle of it, uh, that's. Not entirely surprising that something like that might manifest. I would imagine it happened a lot. Yeah. That happened so. a lot. Um, last question. And I, I hate to ask movie star questions, but uh, I'm curious on the relationship with you with Tom Hanks in the film uh -huh. and whether it became a little bit like the film and a little bit like the character or whether I'm reading into that. No, I mean, it absolutely did. I mean, he, in many ways, uh, held us together. Uh, you know, beyond anything that I think any other actor might have been able to do on, under these circumstances. There were other times where I think there was probably some contention, you know, too. And I think that that's also something which is, you know, is indicated in the film and, or, or represented in the film, you know. Um, you always have those sorts of uh, dynamics that exist with um, a kind of uh, a leader figure, you know, an, an iconoclastic figure. Um, but I also really feel like had it not been him, it would have been could have really been uh, a nightmare to shoot, you know. It really could have been, mm. and ultimately, it was just fun. When we and when we stopped shooting in between takes, I mean, we made a point of really trying to have a good time, you know. Um, it, we didn't need to bury ourselves 
in these characters uh, the same way you might in other movies because as soon as we started rolling it's you know you were you were very much there again so yeah there in the moment yeah. hey thank you yeah thanks, thanks very much great work yeah. I want to know what combat is like through your eyes as an actor because I, I think I know from my father and I think I know from the film what combat might be like in, in my own little world from from a soldier standpoint but as an actor and going in to do this what's it like well, that's an interesting question. I think that, um, you know, Steven Spielberg during the Normandy uh, invasion, the shooting of that, tried to simulate um, warfare to such a degree to where you, to some degree, you felt like you were actually there. I don't want to disrespect any soldiers that um, had actually gone through that experience uh, by saying that I've gone through that. But um, it's just, I think, it's just it's going through boot camp um, and making that being being that uh, hopefully to some degree second nature to uh, to yourself and then going into uh, battle it was just kind of like numbing yourself and just doing the job and getting it done um, and yeah I, mean, I think our film um, you know has to portray a certain amount of um, high intensity to get its message across. Um, a lot of battle, I'm sure, that we've been educated towards is, as uh, Giovanni was saying, I think 60% sitting around, not too dissimilar to the film process. 90% oh, just a lot. complete yeah. being just so bored and 10% yeah. of the most so it really extreme, isn't an, chaotic. So it really isn't an endurance yeah. test. I mean, you go beyond your physical endurance and then some. And mental endurance. Physical and mental, exactly. Yeah. Mm. There was a story that Captain Di uh, told us once that he said, you go through boot camp and basic training and, and or like uh, years of training with the Normandy um, guys, uh, and you're, you establish a relationship with someone and who becomes almost uh, closer to you than your wife d did back home with your best friends. And you're, you, you know, you share personal secrets with him, blah, 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 blah. And suddenly, the first day you step out of that bush, and and he he gets it. Um, he said, um, "What you experience is not, you know." We, he had a, he had us all guessing, like sadness, apathy. We were all going, you know, um, anger, blah blah. And he said, "You you you feel joy." The very first that, emotion is joy. That he got it, and you didn't. I don't think it's joy that he got it. It's joy that you didn't get that it. That you didn't. Right. I'm alive. Not, not, that, not that he got it. Sure. But, and then the guilt Absolute sets in after of that. how could I think that? Of how could you feel those so feelings selfish. for this person and yeah. be so s selfish. And then you start to have this front. And, and he was very, I mean, he was the core, I think, one of the, you know, the core elements to the movie that it probably would not have not been the same movie without. To give you an idea of the... The background that and depth that he took us to as our characters—that's a prime example mm. of one of the stories that. That's just a, you asked sure. about warfare. From, oh, I mean, yeah. and that's—I mean, I, I can't say I've experienced that, but um, according, I think I've gotten very close because of him, Absolutely. Captain Dale. Dye. Hey, if you could address any of the uh, veterans who fought there or even fought in World War II, well, and I'm sure you've ha either had a chance or will have many opportunities to talk to some of them. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to them? I'd say to uh, accept this film as uh, an attempt for us to represent in the smallest way uh, their voice. Uh, I would say that I respect them so much and we've learned, and I'd apologize for not knowing as much as I did in the beginning as I did in the end. I'd apologize for probably ignoring them or not taking them into consideration and not respecting them or not loving them as much as I did at the end of the film. Mm. Very nice. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Nice job. I like this film a lot. Thank you very much. A, a lot of issues about the film that, that always interest me, and one, one is the relationship with the father. Why is the relationship so strained for Homer? Well, I think, I think that there is a, the, the contradiction between the two characters, which is what they both don't see. I think it's the blindness of each other. 
which is his father who has his passion for coal mining, whose perseverance lies there, and Homer's passion for rocket building, which he first finds in the movie. And it's, I think, I think it's John's fear that he, that Homer won't succeed, while well, at the same time, John's love of mining and him wanting Homer to be a miner. Um, and then Homer, seeing that his father doesn't understand that, that makes them constantly bump heads. But it's just, a, it's a blindness in some ways. It's sort of like a metaphoric blindness. And then at the end, they accept each other's passion, which is, I think, what, what it comes about, which is the resolution. In the and it's an it's appropriate way to resolve that, too. You know, and bad films would take that and make the father leave and they'd hate each other the rest of their lives. And yeah. good films, people who really do genuinely love each other, work it out eventually or somehow. I think so. I think also you can sense from Chris Cooper, who is just incredible and intense, and uh, his, this, this sort of dark side is, is luminous, but at the same time you can sense the love, the subtext between the two of them, which is this incredible, unconditional, while at the same time also conditional love between them mm -hmm. that sort of plays throughout the whole thing, which makes it even more complex and ambiguous, which is... I was a kid when Sputnik went up, and I remember going out in the backyard in Portland, Oregon with my father, who was a truck driver, mm -hmm. and we watched it go over, and you could see that little dot, and how fascinated we were with it, and fireworks. Mm -hmm. do, you under, do you have a connection with Homer? What's your connection with him? Well, I think that I think that, that, that initial um, impulse from Homer, that he got that passion, just the drive from seeing Sputnik, um, I think the passion he has for building rockets I have for my acting. And so when I tried to create the character, what I tried to do was not only use what I believed him to be and from use my own personal experience from situations and passionate experiences, but also look at him, the real person. When I met Homer for the first time, I tried to study him in a way, observe him, find detail to try and pick up characteristics so that I could develop somebody who was true to the real story while also at the same time keeping the dramatic intent and content of the story. So um, I, think that, I think that my father and I, are, my father's a director who mm -hmm. works in the business, mm -hmm. and so that, those experience we have, experiences we have together are sort of on the stage or watching a film together, or watching something that touches us both at the same time. So those experiences are very similar to watching Sputnik in fly through the air, you know, so. It is real similar. A lot of kids, I think a lot of kids feel trapped. They feel trapped in our culture. They might be trapped economically or where they live or for whatever reason they feel trapped. The film has a lot to say about that. What, what are we saying to kids who feel trapped? I think that what there's, I think that what's being said is that being trapped is an illusion in some ways. That it is hard, especially in econo economically, I think it's harder to get to get out of, say, inner cities or even small towns. But in the end, I think that what it's saying is that passion and perseverance and the love of what you do in the end, regardless of, I think, even the fact that you may succeed externally, internally, in connections with human beings and the love between human beings is the most important in your life, that's where you will succeed. Because I think in the end, what is, what is prominent is, yes, that, that Homer becomes a NASA scientist, and yes, he fulfills that dream of building rockets, but even more, it's the metaphor between the people who supported him and himself that make this movie, I think, hopefully special. Mm. And I, that's, that's the most fascinating part. Your character does something really great in that he sticks up for himself and what he believes without being condescending to all the people who want to remain minors or are minors. In fact, celebrates them. Hmm. And that's really hard to do. It's a very mature thing. Well, I think, I, think, I think it is. I think that in terms of coal mining, being down in the mine for even a little while, um, it wasn't even a real mine at that. It is an honorable, and, a, and if you're passionate about that, it is an honorable job and experience. I mean, there are people who are coordinators uh, when we were doing it who were telling us what to do and how to do it. And there is an art in coal mining, just as there is and a technique, just as there is an art and a technique in acting, or just as there's an art and a technique in building rockets. It's all, we're all saying the same thing in a different way. Is, and I think that's hopefully why people can relate to it. Mm. So. Very nice. Proud of you. Thank very you good very film. Much. Yeah. Thank you very much. First of all, your name is Haley? Osmond. Osmond. Yes. Okay, good. I want to get the, the details out of the way first. And you're how old? <laughs> I'm 11. And you've been acting for more than half of your life? Yeah, six years. So you're a true veteran in the 11-year-old in the category, <laughs> I aren't <guess>. you? <laughs> yeah. What do you think, um, 
I think a lot of people are going to watch this movie and say, where do I know that, that boy from? Where do you think most people recognize you? Well, uh, first feature ever did was uh, Forrest Gump. And um, yeah, I guess that's how things got started, really. And uh, I've done a couple series. I um, did a Thunder Alley a while ago and um, Jeff Foxworthy show. And I did a recurring on um, Murphy Brown for a little while. So you've done the big screen and the little screen. Yeah. Have you done any stage work? Um, no, but I, I want to. Um, I think that'll be something new for me. I've always wanted to try something new. Yeah, because it's time to start diversifying. Yeah. This is all old hat for you by, well, by this time. <laughs> yeah. um, do you have a preference between movies or television? Um, no, I, I like to do them both. I like to have a nice balance because uh, when you start doing drama all the time or just comedy all the time or television or movies, it, it gets kind of one-sided. Right. So I like just to, to um, change between what I do every once in a while. Well, that's good because they're, they're very different areas. Yeah. Now, this was a very, very dramatic role. This wasn't, a, you know, I wouldn't call this a, a kid's role. Yeah. This was a really serious, dramatic role. When you're as old as you are, where do you, what do you draw from to, to get the level of incredible acting that you showed in this movie? Um, to get to the point where Cole is in the film, you have to, to really become and feel what he's feeling and uh, to have the thoughts that Cole would be thinking and running through your head uh, just like he would. Uh, you have to just read it over and over and over again and really analyze it to understand what, what's making him, what, what's he doing at that minute, what's he thinking. And uh, once you've got yourself into, into the uh, point where Cole is, it ha you have to just to stay with, you have to believe you're not, you're not Haley anymore, you have to be Cole and you're, you're Cole, do what Cole, Cole is, have Cole's instincts, things like that. Well, I would think if that's what you really did, that this must have been an exhausting role. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was intense, but uh, I had fun. Did you? Yeah. What was it like working with Bruce Willis? Uh, Bruce, great guy. He he just so dedicated, just 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 working so hard on on the script and on every scene he was in and every line. We, for the first week before we started shooting in Philadelphia, um, early September, he we um, the whole cast. Um, was and the director Knight were in this room and we were just always analyzing the script, just getting down everything perfect, understanding exactly what was going on at that um, exact moment so that we could uh, have a smooth job on the script when we started uh, shooting. Why don't you tell me a little bit from your perspective what this movie is about, especially what your character is going through? Well, uh, it's about communication or more specifically the lack thereof. It's about the relationships of the uh, the four uh, main cast members and how they can get through their problems and or their uh, problem of not talking to each other. Mm -hmm. What do you think you, that Cole's relationship was like with his mother? Because she obviously loved him a lot, but there, like you said, there was a breakdown going on there. He, his mom is the only one in the world for him who actually loves him, and he has to. He he, he always works so hard to make himself just look as normal as he can for her because in reality he's, he's not that normal at all so because he feels that if he if his mom gets the idea that he's sort of weird a freak then he, he, he'll be alone. They call movies like this psychological thrillers yeah. because there are parts of it that are really scary but then there's also this great dramatic uh, theme running through it but when it came to the scary parts Bruce Willis didn't have anything to do with it. None of the other people really had anything to do with it. You had to carry the really scary parts. What did you do to make it seem so real that you know, you're seeing ghosts? How did you carry the really heavy part of this movie? Well, uh, again, just after I just, I, I really didn't substitute any other image for what Cole was being afraid of at the moment. I had to make myself afraid of what he was afraid of and that was hard since all the things he was afraid of I, I knew uh, they weren't real for the first place and then some of them were, were actually funny people in real life so it, it was it was a, a big challenge having to keep up the um, the fear and to do that I just you just blocked it all of your mind you blocked out who they were and you just knew that they that it was just a terrifying moment in his life and uh, it was hard now, um, is this what you want to do forever and ever? Yeah. You want to keep on acting? Yeah, I'm going to act. Well, I think you've yeah. got an incredible path laid out for yourself. Thanks. Um, can you explain 
kind of the pain, that the, the anguish that this little boy was going through because he internalizes so much of it through the movie, which is really hard for an actor to do because yeah. it's very subtle. He, he, he just, just hides all of it. He's, he's always, it's always there. It's always tormenting him. And it's, it's so hard for him in everyday life because he just has to keep it all, all in here. He, he can't um, reveal his problem to anybody else because they already think he's a freak. So he, he has to, it's, it's hard for him because he's always hiding things. He's always just, he's so self, um, inside himself so much. He, he's, he's, it's hard. It's just so much pressure on him every day. Mm -hmm. So will we be seeing you in anything again soon? Well, um, I hope. Uh, we've been reading, my dad and I, uh, he's an actor too, we've been uh, reading a lot of scripts lately and I uh, hope to be starting something in September, so uh, maybe. Will it be on the big screen or the little screen? Or uh, the probably screen? the big screen. Great. Yeah. Well, this is a phenomenal movie and it's such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. You did nice a really, you. really great job. Thanks. Thank you. Tell me what this movie is about to you. This movie to me is about, it's about communication and the lack of communication and uh, it's about uh, acceptance of something more than what we see and feel immediately mm -hmm. in our little spheres. Mm -hmm. And as this uh, single mom tries to relate to her child where there's clearly something going on there, how does she try to break through those barriers with that little boy? I mean fairly unsuccessfully until he Yeah, he's clean. everything to her and um, she's trying everything in her power to make him happy. She can see that he's not and feels incredibly guilty and incredibly inadequate and and so, you know, the tension in the house, even though she's trying to love him and nurture him and make him feel safe, she feels incredibly unsafe, you know? It's all a bit... Um, and so I think that scene in the car at the end, which that was a scene that really made me want to do the film, serves a few purposes. It, it, it allows him to finally, uh, you know, uh, release this information that he's been holding back and holding back and almost making him as sick, mm -hmm. as, sick as the actual events that he uh, experiences. And... Um, relief for her to finally know that what the story is you know it's not it's it's not so much about her it's it's this wild stuff that he goes through and also it's it's stuff that she didn't necessarily believe in so it completely changes her perception of everything mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah do you think that children by nature are are more accepting or more aware Maybe not of the supernatural or of ghosts per se, but just that well, their world Well, they're just more open broader. because, yeah, they don't, they don't, uh, I think the older you get, the more fear can build into your life because you're aware of things that can go wrong and society kind of gives you a path like, like this and there are rules that you have to abide by. And yeah, of course, there are certain moral rules and that one should ab abide by, but kids are just so open, you know? They're living in a world of endless possibilities, and that's so beautiful. Um, and perhaps that's why um, Cole is linked to this, you know, uh, or has this ability, or even, I mean, why kids have little, uh, um, you know, imaginary friends, you know? Um, I don't know, it's, but children are, f they're amazing. And it's, I wish we could stay that way. Just one more quick question. After I saw Muriel's wedding, I wanted to see you again on screen so badly. Oh. I had the same response with this movie again. When will we see you again? There is a film coming out in September called The Boys, which is an Australian film, which was shot, uh, it was made in 97 actually. Um, so it's, coming out here in September and it's a very different role yet again. <laughs> yeah, I'm playing a Westie scrubber. <laughs> it's, um, it's kind of dark, grim, uh, domestic uh, hideousness, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you're not gonna have to worry about getting typecast if you keep this up, because yeah. you're all over the board. I hope not. And you, you're phenomenal. This movie was really, really great. Oh, thank you. Uh, this movie started as a, a premonition for you, or was kind of inspired, is that right? Well, the whole film has felt 
now we're you know we're ten days out from the movie opening, and you know who knows what it'll do when it opens and how the world will receive it and all. But um, it has felt completely guided from its first thought, you know, from the beginning. And so when I first thought of it, I told my editor, and I'm going to write this script called Sixth Sense, and Bruce Willis is going to be in it, and it's going to sell for a lot of money, and that that is what how it started, you know, and it ha that happened and. Each each thing that happened from that point on felt just just a little bit guided, you know. Each person doing their job just the right way. We happened to find this unbelievable kid actor that just you know it, it's it's not about a kid. It's just an amazing actor and Tony Collette and you know God, I remember that movie I saw Muriel's Wedding. What a great actress! Oh my gosh, I got her in the movie and oh, I love Signs of the Lambs. Maybe we can get that director of photography, oh, I got them. And, you know, the producers of E.T. And, and Poltergeist, they might be good for this. Oh, I got them. And it one by one, and everything's out. I think I should make this at Disney, because they really know how to market to make it Disney. So this was your sixth sense. It's just been great. It's just been great. And um, the things that didn't work out ended up working out, to, you know, in the end, the proper way it should have worked out. And so how did you get Bruce Willis for this movie? We, he was the, the only actor we sent it to, the original. And we thought about a lot of people. I, you know, I thought about a lot of people, and a lot of people approached me for the parts. Mm. Fantastic actors approached me for the part. And, I, you know, he was the guy I was thinking about. And I, even though I thought that earlier, when I got to the time to, to offer it, I just felt, you know, I had a couple moments of, what am I thinking? He's not going to do this. You know, he just did Armageddon, and that's making so much money. And all that. he's never going to want to do this. Let's just go with a smaller actor, or, you know, a lesser-known actor, and go make the, the picture the right way because you're wasting time. Eventually, <clears throat> I said, "All right, let's just offer it to him." <laughs> and we offered it to him. And he said, "Yes." It was amazing. And then he saw my other film and was completely on board. I think it's the best dramatic role he's ever done. Well, I was so you. impressed with not only his performance, but. I thought the casting of this movie was absolutely impeccable. I don't think you could have gotten better performances or better people for every single one of those roles. Did, did, how heavy of a role did you play in selecting those people? Um, well, a lot, I guess, because I'm the director, I guess. But um, it, was a, it was one by one. You know, I starting to realize the kind of acting that I really liked, which was very specific unique, rough, I like, I like rough edges. So if, you know, the actress is doing the scene and she says her line and I don't know, and then after the line she just goes and does some weird body, I like that, that specificity that, it, you know, it's not like I said, why don't you just shake a little bit? It's not, she just did it very specific. Um, and, I, and I started being attracted to that in the people that I was auditioning and it seemed to thematically go with everybody that we hired in the movie. It was very specific, specific acting. I think that psychological thrillers or any movie that has a, a real heavy, scary element to it, I think those are the most difficult movies to make work. What's the trick to making this movie so real and so genuine and just works all the way through? Grounding it in, in reality. All your choices, you know, there are, there's two kinds of, there's movie scares, which are kind of like, Bobby, where are you? Bobby. <gasps> and then Bobby jumps at him and, and laughs and things like that. And that is a cheat because you got the scare, but you've cheated the audience in the sense that you've said to them, what you've really said to them is, boo, you're watching a movie. Funny, aren't we funny? Okay, let's go on with the story. And they're like, oh, we're watching a movie. But if you, if you said, shh, Bobby, did you hear something? And I go, did you leave that door open in the back? And then everyone goes, Nobody's going, hee hee, it's a movie. Nobody's thinking that. They're all picturing their own house and their own back door that they left open. And was that sound somebody coming in and things like that? And they keep on holding it beyond one minute, two minutes, try 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes, holding them in that, is this, is this really happening kind of thing? And it's, it's a fun thing to continue that tension. One thing I haven't touched with you yet, I talked to the other actors about this, but what's the, why don't you tell me in your words what the basic premise of this movie is, since they are your words. Right. Um, the basic premise of it is a, a child psychologist dealing with a, a patient who claims that he sees ghosts. And his investigation into whether this is real or this kid has other, other problems in his life that are leading him to make up the stories about these ghosts. And, whether it's true or not. And um, it's also a movie about communication. 
thematically about people communicating with their loved ones, children communicating with their parents, husbands and wives communicating, people that have passed away trying to communicate with people here, and people learning to say things when they have the chance. Great. Well, I'm glad you had the chance because this is a really unique, wonderful movie with a great ending. Thank you. Oh, phenomenal twisting. <laughs> Loved it. So, thank you. Thank you. I have a million ideas floating in my head. One of them, one of them is that we're, we're so screwed up as a culture. I mean, I look at it and I read about the stuff that happens in the paper. I don't feel disenfranchised, but I understand people who are. And I look at it and then you take it to the extreme and they come in and they, you know, they wipe people out or they do whatever they need to do to get noticed or to feel. And in a, in a, uh, in a million it, levels, it, it operates in this film. Yeah, it'd, it'd be special in, in some sense to, uh, to obtain this notoriety. And, and to, to me, the, the, the question there is, I mean, I watch the commercials and that's what they're selling you. They're selling you a lifestyle that you'll be special. If you, have, if you drink this certain beer, you will have this special life. You'll be considered special. And I, I wonder if there's not a, a correlation there. That's an odd you Don't you, don't you feel, though, though, when you see those commercials, don't you do, I don't know if you do what I do. I look at that and I go, that's BS. Yeah, at 100% now. Absolutely. Only from experience, though. I, I don't think it, in my younger days, no. Oh. There's a great commercial yeah. now. Wait, I got it. Yeah, yeah. There's a great commercial now where it's these beautiful black and whites of, of kids and, and uh, vignette of kids and each one, one saying, I want to work my way up to middle management. Next kid, I want to be a brown noser. Next kid, it's really wow. a very powerful, powerful commercial. Wow. Uh, I, I want to be forced into early retirement. It, it's, it's, and to me, this commercial is Fight Club. Hmm. I, I think that, I think that um, what the film is, is wrestling around in, though, is the idea that, you know, yes, I mean, ideally, we would all become more sophisticated consumers, but I think the film's dealing with the, the fact that uh, our, our generation, as a generation, there really is a substantive difference in us and previous generations in terms of the consumer culture, which is we, we are the first generation raised from the cradle on television. And long before we had a chance to get sophisticated and, and jaded on some levels, our, our value system has been dictated by that, by that consumer culture. It's been, you know, it's been by the advertising culture has been telling us since we were kids that, you know, just as it says in the movie, that, that you know, your spiritual peace, your happiness will be achieved through the acquisition of these material goods or, or that, or that um, you know, the thing to aspire to be is a millionaire or a movie god or a rock star, and that if you're not, on some level, you should be dissatisfied, you know? And, and, and as you grow up and realize, on the whole, that that promise can't be fulfilled, the, per the promise of advertising culture really can't be fulfilled, and that even to the degree that it is, even to the degree that you acquire the right furniture, the stereo, you're never gonna have to upgrade, that's not gonna necessarily make you happy on the inside. And then, and there's a dissatisfaction yeah. that boils it under that. It never makes you happy. No, uh, there's a no. great, there's a great section of the book that we talk about it, and it states that we become spectators, that we're not in there participating, mm -hmm. and uh, and it, and it, it's talking about all the things that we buy and surround ourselves with to anesthetize our life, and uh, th this to me is a is a, the interesting. You know, there's another curious thing that, that interests me. I, you know, I, I guess I'm a sensitive guy of the 90s, you know. Right. I listen and I'm kind. You seem and, sensitive. Well, I'm working <laughs> at it. But at the same time, I long to be a guy. I long to be not so sensitive that I, and the book addresses that a lot. Right. It's got to be in the DNA. Well, like we, we grew up in a, a politically correct era where it's not right to argue or fight mm -hmm. or it's certainly not evolved. That may be true, evolved, but I think you have to go through it instead of immediately saying, we don't do that. You have to go through it to understand it. How can you understand it if you if you have not experienced it? So, and and my question is, is it not in our DNA that we've been, I mean, from the caveman days, from survival, from protecting our own, from, um, um, uh, we're hunters. hunters. Well, that's yeah, that's hunters you know we it, now it's, we're gatherers. Yeah, <laughs> we're hunters now. Yeah, a couple of sensitive guys from the nineties <laughs> right here. Huh? Nice to see you. Yeah. Oh, God, it's Greg, good yeah. too short. Yeah. I have a million questions floating in my head, so we'll get to a couple of them. I'm not sure if I have a million answers, oh, unfortunately. <laughs> well, that's all right, because I, I'm, I'm so curious uh, of what your character represents in the film. I think I know, but I want to hear from you. Well, I could talk about it, but the only problem is that if I, what I think she represents is sort of a problem because I can't really, it's sort of wrapped up in the end. 
She, I think she acts the catalyst for what we discover has really happened, hmm. if you see what I mean. I can intimate to you, and you might understand that, that Norton's character meets Marla and sees in her potential, uh, there's a possible possibility of a relationship here. They're both, well, for one, you know, there's a similarity, because when are you going to find, discover, you know, somebody else who goes to support group for the time we are? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a similarity, and it's uh, that he recognizes, but instead of uh, conf uh, developing this relationship, he does, he develops a relationship with, with Brad's character. In a sense, do the men find themselves in you? Uh, do the men find themselves? Do they see themselves in you? I think very much so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there's a similarity, I guess. They're both sort of, Marla, in a different way, is seeking, has, you know, has got her own sort of uh, uh, sense of, as similar to the boys, a sense of sort of despair and sort of um, feeling that she's sort of living a sort of grey existence, which is not really, not feeling anything. And, uh, uh, and in going to her support group, she feels that's when she feels sort of alive and sort of... I guess in my own life I feel, I never, I've never felt disenfranchised. I felt lonely yeah. you know, and, and isolated, but I've never felt so disenfranchised that I had to go to an extreme in order to feel. feel something. But I understand that. Yeah. Because you see it. You read about it in the paper. Yes. You see it. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's an odd, probably horrible place to be. It's a horrendous place to be. I mean, I can't necessarily speak from personal experience, but from an imaginative leap that one had to sort of um, play on in order to play her. It's horrendous, but it sort of exists, you know, so I, I know people like that, and I know people who, in, you know, uh, different versions of their own fight clubs are to do with, you know, different kinds of um, self-destruction of, like, cutting themselves with razor blades, mm -hmm. or, it, and that, in some ways, seeking pain, the pain is better than feeling nothing. When you look at the film, have you seen it? Yeah. What jumps out and pleases you the most? Um, I think it's, it's just overall the amazing inventiveness and it's utterly unique and utterly un indescribable too and uh, uh, has got an amazing energy to it mm. and uh, is, um, hits one on such a visceral level. Uh, I found it sort of not depressing at all but quite invigorating um, and uh, 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 it's intensely unique. I'm going to ask you a question kind of about acting and how you feel about it. I don't quite know how to say this, but mm. when you're in the middle of a scene and it's working, and you know it's working, is that a feeling that fills you up as a performer? When you know it's working, the best thing is the sense that you're not really there, because you're sort of like, it's happening, and you're not, uh, it's when you're not thinking, actually, when you haven't got this sort of little sensor going on in your mind, or uh, um, it's sort of being, uh, there's a loss of sense of self. And that's when, but then as soon as you're aware of it, then it, come, then it goes away. You can't be as too self-aware. Mm? You can't be so self-aware, it ruins it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's a sort of um, feeling that one's being taken over by something. Mm. So nice film. Thank you. You know, I, I don't think of it, um, I guess I, I should address you as Meatloaf, even though I know you have a real name. Well, I've been called Meat my whole life. We used to do that as kids. We'd call each other, hey, Meat. Did you do that? Uh, but I don't know, kids, that's what they call me. Maybe that's where it came from. But my dad started calling me that first, when did I was like a year old. Really? Yeah. Did, did, the, did the name Meatloaf grow out of your time in Dallas? Yes. Really? Yeah, Meat. I mean, that's what people call me. You just said we, we had a, a, a mutual friend that mm -hmm. I went to high school with. Mm -hmm. I, he would probably know me two ways, ML or Meat. Wow. And so that... Nobody ever questioned it when I was in school, no, because there, teachers would say, "Meet, did you do your homework? You'd go to the, you know, you go to church on Sunday. Glad to see you here, meet." The preacher would say, and then you go to the doctor. You're not feeling good today, meet. What's wrong with you? You know, and and uh, you know, I had a Jewish doctor, by the way. And so, uh, <laughs> and then when you reached puberty, you became Mr. Loaf. Well, no, I didn't become Mr. Loaf until I was doing Shakespeare in the Park for uh, Joe Papp, and I was doing a, a production of As You Like It with Raul Julia and Mary Beth Hurt, yeah. and. Uh, Clive Barnes, theater critic for the New York Times, uh, didn't like the production, but really liked Raul, myself, and Mary Beth, and said, Mr. Julia, uh, uh, Miss Hurt, and Mr. Loaf, and, and then, you know, some nice adjectives that followed that are about our performances. So he was the first, and then after that, Douglas Watson did it, and then pretty soon, you know, even the West Side Times there in New York started calling me Mr. Loaf. Wow. And it wasn't until I got 
seriously, and even as an actor, the only time I ever questioned it was when I was doing the first Shakespeare for, for Joe Papp. I went to Joe, I said, well, should we not use meatloaf? Well, you know, and he goes, well, of course we use a meatloaf. He said, and he said, do you think if Bill Shakespeare was alive today that he wouldn't use meatloaf? Of course he would, and he walked away. He would so embrace I, it. Yeah, he would embrace it. He would embrace it very much. I mean, he has, yeah, absolutely. I'm surprised I'm not in there. Isn't that funny? He, he needs some rewrites. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I, I'm, I have a million ideas floating in my head about this movie. One is just the whole, on, on the surface, the whole idea of that men and men are more and more disenfranchised and trying to find a place at least to express themselves as men or maybe even the masculine side of them because it's so cool to be a sensitive man in the 90s. I, I think, I, I, I think that's, a, that's, that's a level. I think that's one level of it. But I, I, I think... I think it's deeper than that. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes, I mean, of course, I mean, everybody yeah. says it, but I, but I think it not only just men, I think it deals with women, and I think it deals with, with fear, and it deals with self-esteem, and it deals with how you feel about your life, and needing some, some outlet, some, something that you feel like you're in control of instead of life being in control of you. It's like, it's like in the beginning of the movie, there's, there's the saying that, do you own possessions or do possessions own you? And in the beginning of this movie, the possessions are definitely owning, owning the Edward Norton character. And as happy as he thinks he is about owning these possessions, he's terribly unhappy about it. And because he, he's torn and he keeps talking about how he's almost completed his wardrobe and he's mm -hmm. talking about his Ikea furniture and his shopping. But at the same time, he can't sleep, hates his job, thinks he's wrong in what he's doing. And I, I'm... I'm Oh, sorry. Go ahead, have a drink. Right. Oh, that's okay. My but game. there's no sense of, you know, people that want a sense of freedom, sometimes when they get that freedom, there's an enormous price to pay for that, of kind of getting rid of everything, and then you get, and the movie, I think, brings a lot of that out. There's yeah, a, it there's does. A dark, there's an enormous, price. but you know, but there, there, there is a price, but you know what? That the, I don't think the price is too great to pay. Hmm. I don't think the price is too great to pay for feeling good about oneself, and I think that's the key here. It, and and I don't think there's ever too high of a price for feeling good about yourself. I mean, I don't think it exists. I don't think you can pay too much for that. Uh, uh, it just doesn't, doesn't happen. You need, that's what people need, and that's what this movie deals with. And then, but it goes past that, and it gets into control. And when you think you have control, you really don't have control. So how do you come full circle and really have, have it all? And, and, the, and the way is, is and basically, this say, is be the real simple t moral of this is be true to yourself. Mm. That's the real, the real thing. I mean, bottom line, you wipe everything out, and at the very end, he's standing there, and it's, he's, it's basically saying, you know what? I have to be who I am. I have to be true to myself. And that's what it is. And that's his release. Now, I, you know, I go on about, well, aren't the cops coming for him? <laughs> you know. Yeah, when? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's what I said to Edward. I said, Edward, aren't the cops coming for you now? You know, it's just nice to see a guy from Thomas Jefferson in a big damn movie. Oh, it's really nice to this see a guy This is better from... than Black Dog. You think it's I better think it's than Black Dog? I think it's a whole lot Dog? better. I have a million questions um, and ideas floating around in my head. One is that uh, it's nice to see a film where people actually ask for help. Yeah. People who are really kind of a mess but ask for help, or are a mess, mm. um, and has a redemptive quality and yet is a tough film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's a very tough film. Yeah. Do you end up with a film that you set out to be in to make? Yeah, yeah. You're not the director. I agree. Yes, absolutely. I was definitely, I'm definitely, a part of the film I wanted to be a part of. I saw it and I loved it. So. What ple What jumps out and pleases you the most? Everything, everything about that movie. I think that movie is beyond the Call of Duty. I think he. I can't say enough about it. I was just, from every aspect of the film, I think it was superlative, you know, and, and, and new and uh, original. I get the idea, uh, every time I see his work, and he, and he hasn't made that many films, that there's somebody wise beyond their years. That, sure. Uh, that doesn't have to live it to know how to write it. Well, I think he has lived it, in a way, and because uh, I, I, think you li I think people live things relative to their life, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and just because they literally haven't lived it doesn't mean they haven't. And, uh, and uh, I think there are people that are very em empathetic people, you know, that, mm -hmm. that take on other people's woes and other people's feelings. And I think he's written a couple characters in his film like that. And, um, and I think Paul's very affected by life. I think, I think like, 
a lot of the actors are too, a very sensitive group of people, and uh, I think that's why we're all in it. And so I think, you know, hopefully did a good job that way. It's an odd question, but do you ever get nervous acting? All the time. I tried to say my name to the camera and two minutes ago, I was like, Philip Bachman, you know? Uh, yeah, my palms start to sweat. And I, acting's very difficult. It is. Yeah. So I gotta work pretty hard to be good at it, or and else I suck. And how do you work through the nervous part? Just by doing it? Yeah, it's just, no, no, you just, you do work. You do your work, you do what you do, you know. I don't want to get into that. That's just sure. acting talk. No, but it's kind of, I find it kind of interesting. Yeah. When when you're doing a scene, for instance, with Tom Cruise in this film, and you know it's working, is that is that a flying experience, an out-of-the-body experience? When you, Do you get lost in the moment? Well, I think everybody's experienced the mo that moment where it's you, you're creatively kind of effortless, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's... If it's, uh, your thoughts are just coming very easy to you and the answers are coming very easy and you kind of know what to do instinctively. Um, and you know, you, and you know your, your uh, concentration is, is at a peak, you know. And when you're like that, people are just focused on you and you're focused on you and everyone's watching and, and it's good. That's, yeah, that's a great feeling. That's what you hopefully will get. That's what you're striving for. When an audience in Dallas, we don't pay 950 yet. We still pay seven or 650. Is it great? You probably pay great? seven in Dallas. I think we pay six fifty or seven. I think you should go again. We pay four fifty at the matinee. I don't think that's true. Uh, Damn it, we do. It's great. Go before it's six. It's not seven. Don't tell me it's seven in Dallas. It's not. It's six fifty. I think. So. Uh, oh no, no, I'm going yeah. down there. It's yeah. at least eight bucks in Dallas. When people, no, it's not. When oh, people pay their oh. six fifty to see Magnolia <laughs> oh, in Dallas. God. What kind of? This is an odd question, but what kind of things do you want them to think and feel when they come out? First, I want them to feel why are they living in Dallas. That's right. <laughs> okay. um, what do I want to the feel when they come out? Um, I, I don't know what I want them to feel. They're going to feel what they want them to feel. I want them to hopefully, hopefully understand. Hopefully understand that this this film is a special film that will, that is going to stand time. I think. I just think it's one of those films. Mm -hmm. So. I just I just hope they realize what they've just watched. You know that it's nothing has been like it before, and it's it's a it's a new film, mm. and, P, and it is it's new. It's really great. Nice work. Good work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Really nice work. Some films take dialogue because they're not easy, and I, I love this film. I do too. It's operatic. That's a good word for it. It's it very isn't. operatic it's at the huge. same time, and and tragic in a wonderful way. At one point, it seems like everybody in this film ask for help. Absolutely. It's about uh, all of the characters share a, a couple of things, but one of them is they can't do what they've been doing before. They've reached some sort of crisis, some critical mass. They've got to do something different. I, I think Paul just sort of let his mind go and, and went into his subconscious and let it out. And he's so brave to not edit himself. It's such odd things, like the part where we all sing mm -hmm. that song. Mm -hmm. Isn't that so correct and so spooky. Mm -hmm. It's peculiar and it works. Yeah. Absolutely. In, in some ways, I'm watching it, I don't want to read into it biblically at all, but there, it, there's biblical proportions totally. in the film. Is that intended? I think so. I mean, all there was that um, Exodus. Uh, Exodus 8-2. Yeah. Everywhere you look, yeah. there, that were, there was a sign saying that. Um, I, I think I think Paul let the story tell itself. I mean, as he wrote it, I feel like he he, he knew that the, the, whatever it was was going to come out of him, and he let it come out of its own, which is great writing. When I watched the film, also thinking that maybe maybe all of us at some point in our lives need some catastrophic event to set us straight, whether that's literal or not. You know, they say of, yes, that's what they say. For someone to change it takes a, something huge to happen. They say for an alcoholic, you got to hit bottom before mm -hmm. you're going to change your ways. Uh, I think I think that's exactly right. You have to hit bottom. It takes a catastrophe to get people to change their ways. And yet, on the upside, it's a film about immense hope. Totally, there's a lot of hope for your character and the other people in the film. Yeah, you feel that way going into it? Absolutely. Yeah, they're they're all crying out in a way and they're all asking for forgiveness and it's all steeped as you said in hope I can do better I, I know I can be happy I have a lot of love to give I just don't know where to put it do you um, Paul Thomas is creating really an ensemble of actors and you're a part of that 
You yeah. feel a part of that? And totally. And that, that, that's a good thing. Cause that's this a guy, very good thing. This guy's young and has made that many films, and everyone's remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm part of that ensemble. I better be, or I'll track him down and slash his tires. Um, you know, it's like a, every time you do a movie, it's like a pickup baseball team. Nobody knows each other, and it takes a long time for things to sort out. And unfortunately, you, there's usually two or three weeks of film in the can by the time mm. the machine is well-oiled and starting to work. And Paul and Mamet and a lot of, the, a lot of these guys are very smart about, let's, let's keep the team together. I got the actors I need. Let's keep the team together. And, and you can get cooking right away. You know, there's an interesting thing going on. I was thinking about the other day as I look at as I look at Sam Mendes and I look at American Beauty and Fight Club and this film and other films, that uh, the new directors, the good new directors, are not learning off the older masters. Where the older masters, you know, like Spielberg and Lucas mm -hmm. and all them, looked at Kurosawa and looked at John Huston and looked at, at Billy Wilder and what was going on. But the new ones are redefining the way movies are being made. Mm -hmm. They're different. We're uncomfortable with them. We don't know where to put them because they don't fit into a slot. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. I think it is a good thing. It's tough. It's not easy. It would sort of make this a, a time of renaissance. We're not, uh, we're not recycling the past anymore. I think there are a lot of things to do it. One, the world has gotten really kind of nuts. All the rules have changed in our lifetimes. All the rules have changed. And here we are going into the millennium, and what a great film to open in December of 1999. And also, uh, filmmaking has gotten bigger. There's so many toys available to them. Whatever you can imagine, they can shoot now. So the sky's the, the limit in the, filmmaking. Isn't it wild? And it's happening right now. It's not happening, about to happen, or was happening. It's happening. We're in the middle of it. The I whole know. industry's changing. I know. And it's kind I, of think, I think filmmaking is the films is the number one American export now. Really? Yeah. And we over, it used to be military things. And now we export films and art. Better films than Furbies. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Nice to see you, to you, Good to see you again. Boy, good job in this film. Thank you. Thank I you. find uh, the human opera of all of us yeah. is pretty. Have you seen this film? I have not seen the version that you've seen. I saw a three-hour and 30-minute version of it about six months ago, yeah. four or five months ago. Well, the human opera of all of us is pretty compelling stuff. Yeah. You play a character who really, in some form or another, starts asking for help. Yes, yes. Well, he's, uh, he finds out that his, uh, that his time may be limited, so he's uh, he's seeking f redemption, I think, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and he finds out. Uh, I mean, for me, this is one of the fascinating truths of this character. Uh, often in stories and in movies, when when uh, sort of uh, darker characters seek redemption, they uh, they sort of usually find it. Uh, I, I think my character finds out that it's not so easy to get. Right. That uh, living a life of dishonesty and betrayal. Uh, and life that has been harmful to many of the people around him, and he used uh, uh, and abused many people. Uh, when he decides to turn the corner, uh, because he finds out his time is limited, he discovers that, uh, that it's not so easy to, uh, to it, that in the blink of an eye, you can't make up for a whole lifetime. I think he uh, represents a lot uh, of lot, not only of what we read about, but what we, some of us know about, that there are people who are public figures who are different, Yes. than what we think they are, Yes, which happens with actors a lot. Uh, so I'm told, yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> well, you know, actors. as you watch it, and, and mm -hmm. I think it's true with that. I, don't, I shouldn't pick on actors because it's true with banking. And sure, no, I, I think it's, yeah, actors get picked on because it is sort of public. But, I mean, everybody has a, a kind of a, you know, an outward persona and mm -hmm. maybe another one that they, that they're only their family or somebody very close to them sees. Do you know when you're working, this is a little more philosophical, but do you know when you're working on a film, when you're working with a director who is special? Are you aware, ever aware of that, or is, is it always kind of the same experience? Oh, no, it's not the same experience. And every every director has his own signature, as it were, and uh, has his own uh, perspective, his own way of approaching a scene or, or of communicating with an actor or of illuminating uh, corners of the script that were not clear. They, they all have their own ways of doing this. Um, Paul's is done with uh, Paul's is done on a very intimate level, which I think is one of the things that attracts a, a lot of actors to uh, the, who want to work with Paul. His is very close and very intimate uh, and, and very genuine. He's not doing a number. I, I never sense that Paul is like, oh, I'm going to work this actor. I can't get what I want using this approach, so I'll try this approach and he'll respond to it. I don't see any, um, any design in Paul's uh, mode. 
Not a lot of pretension. None at all. He's just it's just the way he is. He's like, uh, and I say he's like he's like a like a kid with a with a new toy that he loves, mm -hmm. and he's very happy about it, and he wants to share it with you. And he's a very bright kid. Yeah, he's smart. Yeah, he's very smart. Yeah, I mean, you look at Cradle Will Rock, and you look at The Insider, and you look at this film, and they're all real different films, very, but very all different. very good at what they set out to do. Yes, yes, yes. And yet, is the approach all different for <clears> all three? <throat> well, it's interesting that all three of the films that you, those three films that you mentioned, actually a fourth film, I don't know if you've seen yet, which is um, um, uh, Ripley, The Talented mm -hmm. Mr. Ripley, the yeah, Anthony no, Mangella yeah. film. All four of those films, mm -hmm. the director is also the writer of the screenplay. In Michael Mann's case, he is the co-author with Eric Roth of the screenplay, but Tim Robbins wrote his screenplay, mm -hmm. and Paul, of course, and Anthony Mangala yeah, wrote Anthony his. Mangala did. So this is interesting, too, that these men who write their own screenplays, they have a particular way of dealing with everything on the set because their vision is so complete. And I, it's, it, my experience is that when, when, a, uh, when a director has not written his own screenplay, uh, it changes how he deals with things. He may have to... Uh, he may feel either either contractually or ethically, for example, if he wants to change or modify something in the original script, he may either legally or ethically feel that he has to consult with the original writer first. Mm -hmm. I did a film uh, a few years ago with an extremely famous director, an Academy Award winner, actually, a script that he did not write. <clears throat> and that he, as it turned out, discovered had more and more problems than he had originally thought. So every morning we would sit down, uh, and this was his way, uh, Unique way of dealing with this, I'll tell you. But he, he would. There were other ways he could have dealt with this, but this was his way of doing it. He would sit down with the actors who were in the work to be done that day, and the writers. There happened to be two writers of the screenplay, and he would. We would go through each line and each moment in in today's work, and he would ask us what we thought about about these this moment or that moment. Now this apparently maybe his relationship with the writer wasn't too good gave him an opportunity to shift it onto the actors, mm -hmm. then as the actors would say, I find this a little awkward or that, then he could come in yeah. and sort of support and so on. It's just, uh, it's a different but he way didn't write it. it. Right. If he had written it, we would have come in and found a new scene, I mean, if he right. didn't like it, or, or if he wanted to change something. He didn't have to confer with anybody. Mm -hmm. you know? Different so, way of doing things. A totally different way of doing it. Yeah. But these four films, though, with the exception of The Insider, which is co-written, uh, but still, Michael Mann was there at yeah. every step of the way. So. Uh, it gives them an autonomy, and it gives them a kind of, uh, what can I say, a kind of honesty in dealing with things. They don't have to skirt around anything. They can just be very direct about it. Mm -hmm. I don't like this line I wrote. I'm changing it. Right. <laughs> nice Simple as that. Well, yeah. Good work. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm a little in awe of the film. I have uh, lots of ideas floating around in my head. One is, is I appreciate a film that where the people who are in trouble ask for help. Because at some point, everybody, in their own way, Ask for help. Do you feel that way about your character? Um, yes, I do. I didn't think of it that way, that she asked for help. I think she's looking for, you know, help or... Yeah, she might not verbalize it, help me. Right, and, but there and is... She is the, she's the one that probably holds back the longest. Right, that's true. Yeah. What is troubling her the most? I think it's a combination of things, and I think it's things that happened in her childhood. You know, abusive, dark situations and how she responded to them. Are you aware when you're in the middle of a film, especially working with, with Paul, that you're working with a director who's special? Yes. He's just am amazing. He is. He's a genius. And he's a brilliant artist. And he just has this amazing capability of capturing the souls of people and you know writing it out and then getting it out on film. And there's a real it, redemptive quality. I, I know that word's thrown around a lot, but that's really true about this film. But his other work, too. Yeah. But it's not just showing us how dark we can be. But that we can transcend that and come out of it. Right. And I don't want to give away the end of the film, but you have just, you know, the great shot at the end of the film. Right. Which, which is a lot about hope. Yes, I agree. For people who are probably pretty hopeless at that time. Yes. What kind of director is he with you? He doesn't throw chairs. He doesn't... No, he's no, never found a chance. Not a maniac. <laughs> he's, How does um, he get out of you what he wants? I don't know. How does he communicate with you? He, um, we just talk, and he just knows when we're working. He just knows the right thing to do at the right time. Isn't that amazing? Yes, it is. It's totally amazing. I, I don't know how to put it into words. 
in the grand scheme of making films or even working on television, is he unique? And in what way is he unique? I think he is unique because I think, you know, as I said before, I think he really is looking at humanity, at people, you know, how we all work. Mm -hmm. And I think he's also really unique in that when he, the, what he chooses to make for his film is that, you know, it's like showing people, you know, look, this is what's going on. You're affecting this person, they're affecting this person. And, and it's unique that it's not just that, that, they, that then he makes this symphony of da-da, and you can rise above it. You don't have to be stuck. You don't have to suffer for the rest of your life. I think that's unique. At one point in the middle of a movie, I felt like I was watching a human opera. Yes. On film. It's operatic, yes. It's very operatic. Yes. I want to ask you an odd question about acting. If you didn't make a dime acting, yes. take away sense of income or publicity or notoriety about what you do, and it just gets down to the moment of doing it, what mm -hmm. do you really love about acting? I guess I love that, that moment of doing it, where you just, everything is like so alive, and you're being this character, and it's just all there. I, I guess I love that. Do you find acting fulfilling as fulfilling now as when you first started? Um, you know, acting with for Paul with Paul is the most fulfilling I've ever found it. Hmm. When is acting bad? Acting is really bad when uh, acting itself is not bad. There are bad situations, but there are bad situations in life. There are bad situations when I go to the store. There you go. Or I fly on a plane. Exactly. Or I have to deal with other people sometimes. Exactly. I guess that's it's normal in, in normal true life. Mm. <laughs> Very good. Nice job. Good to see you in this film. Thank really you. Really good work. Thank you. Hey, I dig this film a lot. And uh, nice. you know what? I, 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 I've got to tell you, when you go into a movie about gladiators and you haven't seen one in 40 years, and, your exp and it's who's in it and who makes it, Ridley Scott, and the expectations are high. And I just love to see a film that delivers that stuff. Yeah. And that's not always true. No, no, it's not true, but I, I, think, I think this film uh, does. I mean, it, it certainly exceeded my expectations, uh, um, and I, I worked on it, but you're never quite sure how it's going to turn out. Uh, but, but I think the finished product is brilliant. Because you want the things that a film about gladiators, titled Gladiator, to deliver. Mm -hmm. what it what it kind of promises to be uh and and it does i mean that it, it kind of it's a film that seems to have everything um not only does it have these kind of brilliant elaborate action sequences and and wonderful sets and um i think a, um, a realistic representation of of rome during that period but also um a very humanistic story mm -hmm. um at the core of it and it's it's so rare to find films that that have so much to offer um, my, my, because I grew up watching those films. I look good for 67, don't I? Yeah, but, uh, really good. Are you? Thanks. Really? No, I'm not. Oh. But, uh, you know, I grew up, you know, so Spartacus gullible. and all that kind of stuff. But the Roman emperors in those old movies, Caesars in those old movies, were so swarmy. You know, there's a history of that whole kind of, oh, man, you don't want to get too close because you're probably going to die. Well, I honestly, I never saw any of those films. I'm, I'm ashamed to admit. Um, although I think it kind of worked out well for me because uh, uh, I kind of went in with a, a, a kind of a fresh idea of, of what it was. Um, no, wasn't influenced by any other films. Um, but yeah, the, the, Rome certainly had its fair share of mad emperors. Uh, but you can imagine that that's, that sense of power uh, would, uh, would, would taint and distort one's mind. It'd make you nuts. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it would make you nuts. Also, you play an emperor who is so young. Mm. He was 19 years old. Really? 19 when he succeeded his father, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, ex ju just that alone and that much power, I mean, that's, that's more than we, we give pro athletes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, 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 uh, it's far too much, especially with someone of Commodus' disposition. Um, he seems uh, very um, insecure and has always felt that he never really lived up to his father's expectations. Um, and so suddenly to be um, uh, thrust into this position with that much power, um, I think is overwhelming. He doesn't really know what to, to do with it, um, but, to, but try and kind of uh, please his own uh, demented desires. Mm. You know, in, in the making in, in of movies and in the casting of movies, for me in the watching of films, some things are obvious and some things are better because they're not. When I found out you were casting this film, 
I kept thinking, well, that, oh yeah, that would work. Hmm. When you were casting that film, were you surprised? Um, well, it was, a, it, was a, it was a bit of a process. I mean, I, I, um, uh, I, you know, I met with Ridley and, and, and read for him and, and tested, um, so I wasn't sure. But uh, um, yeah, I didn't really know. I didn't really know what to think. Uh, I felt that the the test that I'd done was um, uh, was interesting, and, and the 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 take I had on the character um, mm -hmm. that I thought was was a, a unique one. And I just hope that it, you know, in Ridley's eyes, it would, it would fit with the rest of the, the film and the characters. You know, there are filmmakers who are real street level, filmmakers who are big and epic, and some who are visionary. Where does he fall in? Um, I, I think he combines uh, all of those. That's why he's so unique, um, is that he doesn't just make uh, big, spectacular films uh, that lack sub substance. You know, it's, he's certainly not a filmmaker that, that uh, it's, it's style over substance, his films. Um, and yet they're not just uh, little dr dramatic um, the films. Um, so it's rare to find a director mm -hmm. that can encompass uh, all of those qualities. I, mean. I think if you ruled over me at that time, you'd kill me in five minutes. Really? I don't know, man, because I'm over here quaking. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm I dead, know, man. man. Really? Yeah, I'm a dead you have man a walking presence, really? right now. Nice to see you. How about you too? Yeah, I enjoyed <laughs> thanks, that. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Have you seen this film all the way through? <laughs> yes, I saw it. What jumps out and just knocks you out or pleases you the most? Um, I, I, you know, I didn't know what to expect, even uh, being there for you know, all, you know, those couple months of, uh, of filming it. I didn't know what to expect and how it's gonna read on screen. And since I don't see, uh, you know, I don't see dailies, it was, it was a beautiful surprise to, uh, you know, to see the size of it. The size and, uh, you know, and also the size, you know, the, 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 the story, the, uh, the essence of the story, too. Did you feel like, and I don't want to compare this to Amistad, but did you feel like you didn't have to carry it? You know what I mean? Uh, uh, did not, uh, like you yeah, had to carry that film, but then, you know, it's a... It's right. No, I mean, yeah, but uh, it was nice not having to carry it. Were you, yeah, le I guess less intimidated? Yeah, yeah. Or more, maybe you were more. No, you know. less. Less? L less because it didn't demand so much hmm. as uh, the previous. When you fight in movies, uh, you can ruin a movie if you don't do it right. I, I think there are certain mechanics in movie making, especially in battle sequences, and you know, if they don't work, hmm. it, it ruins the whole effect of the whole. Well, Gladiator, yeah. it's uh, basically given the fact that, uh, uh, you know, Ridley Scott was directing it, you knew that uh, it was going to stand and uh, given the fact uh, you know the the, uh, the, uh, the beautiful ensemble cast uh, Russell Crowe you know Joaquin Phoenix you knew that that was gonna you know come out really good even though even though you say that sometimes people are you, you can be as earnest as you want and still yeah. make a movie that doesn't work and I yeah. think this I think the gladiator stuff in this just works great does it work because, and do you know when it's working, when battle scenes and fight scenes are working, even though you're doing it shot by shot? Can you tell, is there a rhythm as an actor that it works? <sighs> wow. Uh, sometimes. And sometimes you, you, you have a hard time believing it's working. Sometimes. But that's, uh, you know, where you have to have faith in, in the director. And, you know, what better person to, uh, uh, to have direct this film, you know, or to be directed by? Uh, you know, and uh, you know his credentials are, you know, fabulous. And uh, your story just knocks me out. Just mm -hmm. your whole personal story, and just the right. whole, uh, you know, what you were doing before and what you're doing now. And I think people are real curious about you now. Now you're mm -hmm. in another really big, high profile. Are you, do are you doing well? People, I think people want to know about you. Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And uh, you know, DreamWorks has been so so good to me. Steven Spielberg, and uh, you know, it's it's a gift. Sometimes when people get a, a little bit of fame, it ruins them. Mm. But you seem settled with at least the amount that you have, and the direct because it's about the work. Well, it's about acting. It's about well, it's about acting, and it's about the world, and you're still a human being. You know, and th that has to be. Uh, you know, you you don't become uh, necessarily. Uh, better than, you know, a, a God, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because you are, 
in movies and because people are screaming your name and so forth. And, and so when you have a, uh, a really good, you know, base, you know, upbringing, it's, that helps. Humility is important. The humility is very important, very important. And uh, yeah, I will take you far. You're in a big gladiator movie. Thank it's, you. Uh, it's, Thank you. It's Thank you, sir. So it's pop to it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yeah. you. Just kind of in the monumental uh, epic of film, sometimes some movies are bigger than others, some are small, intimate. But in order to make this work, it has to be intimate and it has to be huge just because of the nature of it. Yes. I guess as an actress going into it, can you explain the mindset? Is it always the same on every film? Or when films are a little bit bigger than life or recreating large life like this, is it a different approach or is it the same? Um, no, I didn't feel that, that, it dif that it differs that much. What, uh, you know, it's, it's almost as if you look at the character, at least I did, you know, I look at the character and I, I, I look for what I need for her, you know, and, and, and how to prepare for her. But I didn't have in mind, you know, I didn't, and I felt perfectly uh, safe with Ridley that he was going to respect uh, the integrity of, of the story, you know, and that, uh, that he was going to make sure that, though the action was going to be spectacular, that, that he was going to make sure that the intimate moments would be powerful, too. I, li I like the idea in this film that they that the, that, he, that Ridley held back and did the sexuality more subtle. Yes. A bad movie would not do that. It yeah. would throw it right in your face. Yeah. Um, I think it's 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 a very there's a lot of sweetness in in those moments and and I think it's more about what what the people feeling that are feeling that they're losing rather than what they're trying to gain. Yeah. Mm. Have you done anything in your life that prepared you for this particular film more than anything? Not in any other thing than, than reading, I guess. And mm. I've lived a little bit in Italy, so that, that probably, you know, gave me some, some closeness to the, the place. I definitely felt like it was close to home, you know, because I, I've been living in Rome for some years and, and, and in Milan, and I, and I absolutely love the place. So to mm. a certain way, yeah, maybe that. I, I think people, especially people in this country, that, you know, when you study Roman school and then as an adult when you go over there and see the Colosseum, you're still kind of amazed at how outrageous the whole Colosseum scene was and how outrageous the whole Caesar and Emperor and the whole, everything surrounding that was. Yes. And how decadent it was. Well, some of it was decadent, but some of it was also just plain grand and, mm -hmm. and astonishing. And there was definitely a search for, for aesthetic purity, you know, and the part of the people who were building, you know, there was a lot of really uh, wonderful ideas, that, you know, having come from Greece and, and you know, the Hellenization of all of Rome. And, and I think those are really astonishing things to see when you do go and see. You know, they can't, you know, dig for, you know, put down electrical lines without, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> having everything stopped by archaeology teams, you know, because it's, it's just so full of history. Isn't that amazing? It like, is wonderful Because we would thing. think in this country how backwards it would be, and yet it was so forward. The Egyptians were very forward, and the Romans were very Yes. Very forward thinking and, and just the architecture alone. Beautiful. Yeah. I want to ask you kind of a, um, a, a little bit more about acting. I, if you didn't make a dime acting, if it just boils down to, to uh, well, you take away income and publicity and notoriety, it just gets down to the moment of doing it, what do you really love about acting? I would like to interject the fact that I'm certainly not a rich woman, so, <laughs> you know. I, I didn't imply that. <laughs> so I have been doing it for that reason for a long time, you know, for the reason that I just love it. I just love it. I love to walk onto a set, and I love to work with talented people, and I love to tell stories. Do you find acting more fulfilling now than when you started? Yes, uh, I, I certainly do. I feel that um, I'm starting to be less scared, scared, mm. and not that it's ever going to go away, and I think it's perhaps even a healthy thing to have, you know, with some, some notion of fear at a certain time. But I definitely find it a much more comfortable process than I did in the beginning where I was just all out scared. Mm. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think a lot of people that watch movies have no idea that actors do get frightened from uh -huh. time to time. And there's a process that you go through to, to become comfortable. Yes. Also, uh, when you're in the middle of a scene in, I, I know you didn't reconstruct the whole Coliseum, but in some of these sets are pretty grand. Um, is it easier to get lost in the moment as an actress? 
it's not an easy thing. It's very difficult, and I think it takes a lot of, uh, of, of different components to make it happen. You know, it's a wonderful thing when it does happen, and, and when you have been in, in that kind of moment, you wake up afterwards and you go, Phew, this was just, this was fabulous. Is that rare? It's, it's, it's harder than you think. Yeah. yeah. Mm, nice to see you. You're very welcome. Good work in this. Thank you. I, I'm kind of a little bit overwhelmed by the film. Mm -hmm. Too many questions for the amount of time. But mm -hmm. when you start to recreate Rome, mm -hmm. what, what of, of all the things that are daunting, what's the most daunting? Um, it's not really. I mean, you get used to you know everything you address. Every project has a new set of problems, and uh, and I knew it would be a large you know large scale process, but. You get so practiced at knowing how to put all the pieces in place and with the right people. You know, it's all to do with hiring, putting, getting the right people to do things for you and having a relationship with those people. It is, on, particularly on a film like this, it's a real team thing. Hmm. Mm. Did you play with the looks of the actors a lot in this film? Did I? Did you play with the looks of the actors a lot? You mean physically? Lot? Yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, I'm... Uh, I, s I tend to cast, uh, somebody walks in the room in a casting session, I have no idea who they are. I'm usually interested either immediately or less interested by the first appearance. Hmm. Then, of course, it's down to how they do it. Hmm. And then you can always be totally surprised and have a 180 degree turnaround. That's what's fun about casting. Russell Crowe's a bit of a chameleon. Mm -hmm in the sense that he's not a one-note actor. Mm -hmm. uh, and you notice that in The Insider, especially in this film, sure. and LA Confidential, but boy, he pulls this off. This mm -hmm. is yep. not only powerful stuff, but introspective stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we wanted, you know, I didn't want to go into a film where we just made a film about rock and roll with armor and swords. And, and um, that was one of the hardest things to finally be, get nailed to the wall in terms of our all. Hour, and I'm saying that, I'm saying, you know, DreamWorks, Walter Parks, and Doug mm -hmm. Wick, um, myself. It was actually a very good uh, relationship, one of the better relationships I've had in terms of development of script. Um, it was really good. Very civilized, as opposed to, it can be the reverse. <laughs> it, it was great. It can be hell on earth. Oh, absolutely. It was great. It was great fun. It was, a, and it was a, uh, because we were on the gun, under the gun, we decided to make it. You know, we were going to go for this, and um, the script was there, but it still had a way to go. When a film is called Gladiator, and it's about that time period, and it attempts to be accurate about it, mm -hmm. and authentic at least about mm -hmm. it, even mm -hmm. though it's fiction somewhat, uh, mm -hmm. you want a film, I want a film to deliver. Mm -hmm. I want a film to, if it's going to be about gladiators, to have really great gra gladiator stuff in it. Sure. Where does this film deliver for you? Um, well, I'm pleased it delivers. On, in fact, I was, I'll give you a little anecdote. I was watching the film yesterday. I was in London checking a release print. And normally I could high speed that through, you know, and just go yes, no, yeah, no, no, with no sound. I thought, I'll check the sound because it's a married print. And so I ran it, and I nearly missed my flight because I got totally hooked. Now, that's a really good sign. And because I've now seen it so many times, I was thinking how well the character and story stuff stood up as well as the action. And I think that's, that's what I'm happiest about. Well, lastly, there's choices that you make in making films. And one of the storyline choices, I remember in Spartacus, they pulled out that whole homoerotic kind of undertone I thing, and then they put yeah. the bathing scene yeah, back Yeah, and now we've got brother and sister. And now you have brother and sister. Mm -hmm. w was that a choice you made to put that oh, in? Oh, yeah. yeah I wanted the, you mean the, the possible mm -hmm. relationship? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, I think it was partially historically accurate, as far as one could tell, because they were all into all kinds of things in those days. Mm -hmm. And I think, I believe that uh, partly to do also um, more conventionally, Marx Aurelius's wife was on her own so often that it was even questioned as to whether or not actually Commodus was actually the son of Marx Aurelius. So I figured this is fair game, so I think this would make it more interesting this tension between the brother and sister mm. and make it um, one of, did it once happen or didn't it? <laughs> Very nice. Good, Good to see you.